Hey guys, Dave Troop here, fifth episode of the Snapshots interview series. Today I'm joined by Eric Snipe Down Rona. So how's it going, dude? It's going great, man. Just uh, getting the day started. Got a day off from class, so just trying to get some things done here. <laughs> That's always nice, the little day off. Yeah. Uh, so we have a lot to talk about, so I guess we'll just get right into it. Um, so how did you start gaming in general? Like, how did you get into playing video games? And then from there, how did you get introduced to Halo? Yeah, I really just started playing video games when I was a kid. I uh, started off with N64. I uh, played a bunch of just like, you know, like, Mario Party, Super Smash Bros. Then started getting into GoldenEye, and GoldenEye I really took a liking to. Um, I was a lot better than the older kids who were the ones who really played that game more often. I was super young at the time GoldenEye came out, but I um, that was just the game I really enjoyed. And then after that, the Xbox came out, and I went to a LAN with some of my friends who basically had been playing Halo 1 for the longest time. I started playing, became really good really fast, and they basically forced an Xbox on me because they knew... They were like in shock at how fat, how good I had become so quick, and ever ever since then, um, those are the same people that really introduced me to some of the top players like the Ogres, um, Zyros, Walshy, just some of the biggest names back in the day. And it's kind of crazy how quick I learned about you know competitive gaming. And once I heard that people actually competed to be the best, I was my competitive drive kicked in, and instantly I was like, well, know what I want to do, and I wanted to just be one of the best players. So that's pretty much how it all got introduced to me. And ever since, I've just been competing to be the best. So. So, worked out nice. So you, you found out about it in Halo One then, because we're talking about Zios. He was that was really his period. Was um, so how why did it take you so long? Because you didn't go to an event till 08, right? So what yeah, what kind of happened in that in that time frame? Were you just playing locals, just playing online? Like what what happened there? Uh, yeah, I I was playing I was playing a lot of locals. There were actually some people who used to go to Halo One tournaments that I used to land with. Uh, no one would really know who they were. There were some twins. There was like two tab, three shift, the general. Um, some people that no one would really know too much, but um. Yeah, I, I just, I was too young, and my parents weren't really okay with me going to these tournaments because they didn't know much about it, and they thought the whole, you know, they were the naive parents that didn't really know anything about gaming and kind of thought, like, it was going to be, like, a scam that I was going to go and I was going to meet some weird people. And, it, and, and it, like, I really just took some steps to prove to them that I was, like, mature enough to know what I'm talking about, and I kind of, like, showed them these MLG tournaments that were going on, streaming on, you know, MLG TV or MLGpro.com when it was back, when it was that website back in the day. And I showed them kind of the stuff, the big events, the production, all that, and they were just in shock. Um, and I was supposed to go to one Halo 2 tournament, but the one I was supposed to go to, my ride actually didn't show up the day of the tournament. So that kind of ended my my run in Halo 2 that I was going to go to. But it kind of worked out for the best because I ended up like, it didn't hurt my career at all. Who knows how I would have done. Maybe I would have done really poorly. I didn't have like the best teams, but I got my shot in Halo 3. I convinced my parents, like if I get good grades, if I do like stuff around the house and it really just all worked out, and I started really believing that I was like mature enough to handle this kind of stuff on my own. I found my own hotel, found my own way there, paid for everything, and they just like I think I just like more so impressed them enough to where they were like, okay, you can go. And it was on my birthday weekend where I was turning 16 or 17 at the time, so that was my first tournament, 2008 Meadowlands, and I ended up getting seventh place at that tournament, and that kind of just is what skyrocketed my career. Yeah, I was gonna say because um, you know when when most pro players talk to like. Uh, a common question that you guys get in your streams that I see asked a lot is, oh, I want to go pro, how do I do it? And the, the number one thing uh, seems to be like the unanimous answer is just go to events, get your name out there, play, um, and slowly work your way up the rankings, right? You kind of skip that whole, like, I'm going to suck and grind yeah. through the event stage. Like, so uh, Eli Gunshot and I can't remember, who is your, your four? Uh, Silent. Silent. So these guys were around, like Eli and Gunshot were around in Halo 2. They weren't, I mean, they're not like the Ogres or top, really top tier players, but they were definitely recognized names. So how did you end up teaming with these guys as an online kid? Uh, in Halo 2, I was, I was, I was literally the online kid. Like that was me. Like if there, if anyone wanted to know who the best people online were, it would be me. And it was like Tensor. And that was basically like the crew of online kids, and I had like my little group that I played with, and I was like, I was a super high level. I was like a 47 in Team Hardcore, so I matched pros all the time, and I was I was like a 40 above in multiple playlists. So I was I was always matching pros, always beating them, and it was like that kind of exposure because getting a high level in Halo 2 is not easy at all, and that is like that basically allowed me to play against top players all the time which is something that is the hard part to do about now is because there's no real way to like get into lobbies with a bunch of pros or like find ways and that was my way of getting into pro lobbies and after that you know I had a couple pros send me friendly quests like strong side I remember dropping like a plus like 33 on shockwave in a matchmaking playlist against like him and his teammates and some of his teammates 
you know, some of his teammates sent me friend requests. Shockwave hated me from then until about 2009. Because um, <laughs> I was just like that kid that was just hosting and abusing everything. But, I mean, that that kind of exposure really helped me out. And through that kind of stuff, you know, like players like Eli and Gunshot who were placing, you know, top, like, 24, top 16 at the time in Halo 2 tournaments really were like, okay, this is an up-and-comer. Like, he's consistently doing extremely well online. And uh, they just kind of like had always wanted to team with me in Halo 2, but they just never really got the chance. So when Halo 3 came out, and I like told them straight up, I was like, I can go. Like my parents are okay with me going to tournaments. So they were like, okay, it's a new game. He has time. We can work with him. And it ended up um, working out really well. I honestly didn't know what to expect going into that tournament, but I did know that we were better than a lot of the teams there, besides like a lot of the pro teams, which is where really were like it kind of like capped off because we got destroyed by Straight Ripon when we played them for top six, I believe, when we when we were. When we were there, but our, we got a favorable bracket, and we ended up getting a seventh, eighth at the first tournament, and uh, that just that really after that, I got multiple offers from a lot of different teams. Ended up taking a good one from Instinct, and that's really just where like it all just goes uphill from there. Yeah. So let's let's talk about medals a little bit, because um, that was your first event. So how like what was your realist? Did you have like a realistic expectation going in? Like were you like we can beat any team, or were you like if I'd be happy with top sixteen, top eight? Like what what was your goal going for that tournament? Yeah, to be honest, I had been to multiple lands, um, not against good players, but every land I'd gone to, I played out of my mind. Like, I, I won all my locals and everything like that, so I didn't really understand the difference between online and land at the time because I was so good online and I was good on land that I was like, it's the same, we're going to go, and we can beat these teams, we beat them online. But when we got to, we got to land, and you know, my expectations were we can beat anyone, but after, like, after playing better teams on land i was like okay this is like different this is a different environment but we were still very good which is why like we were able to beat the other team like the other amateur level type teams so like the like our seventh to the top 16 like those teams were not as difficult but playing pro teams was much different and that's really kind of like where like a respect level is gained of like these players and what they've done for so long especially like players like final boss who have consistently just like taken out their competition over and over and over again and that was that was cool and it really made me realize the importance of like actually getting to play with your teammates outside of just online and um getting going to like uh lands if you're able to yeah um so what was like was it a big difference for you when you got to an ebo because you said you didn't really think uh, much about like lands so you thought it was similar to online but I'm assuming if your local lands were anything like mine, the difference between them and an MLG event, it might as well be the same thing. Uh, it's like a giant, a giant, giant difference, right? Did that come into effect at all at your first tournament? Did you feel like you got like nervous or jitters or anything like that? That's something funny is like I, I really didn't. And that was one of the biggest things about me when people were going into that tournament is they thought I was just going to, I've always been so good online that I was just going to get to this tournament and just be like a nervous wreck and like not... <laughs> not be good and i remember walking up and um a guy talent at the time who was who was a pretty established and everyone knew who he was yep. came up to me right away and he was like you're sniped down you're a lot ne less nerdy looking than i thought you'd be and i just like started laughing and it was it was cool <laughs> I, th I thought a lot of people didn't like me because i did get a lot of hate from a lot of pros you know i'd get kicked from lobbies from beating a few pro players like two or three times in a row in free falls and they'd kick me because they don't like losing and it, it was kind of rough, but I was not nervous. All I wanted to do was prove myself. Um, that's pretty much all I had wanted to do since day one. I didn't really care about the money or the placings. I just wanted to show people that I can compete because that was just what was drilled into me that you won't be good enough, you're not good enough. And it, it was like, that was just constant, like, that, that was just me constantly being reminded that, like, I want to prove you wrong. And that's just, like, that's how I kept getting better and better. So, um... I don't really think nerves ever came into came into effect at the first tournament. I think the the first time I ever really felt nerves was when I was on main stage when I played for Instinct, and even then, I I think the first game I I didn't go massive positive, but I dropped forty two assists in a flag game, and after yeah. that, I was like, I'm good. Like I, I'm I'm just as good as anyone else up here. So it, yeah, was, it yeah. was a fun experience. Yeah, I think I, I think it was uh, who was it? it was Roy who got like forty three kills, and you had like forty three assists and like yeah, twenty five kills. Yeah, it was something ridiculous yeah, like that. that. It was that, the most assists I'd ever seen in the game. Yeah, that game was insane. Yeah. Um, so let's let's talk about San Diego a bit. Um, so Victory X leaves uh, to join Triggers Down, and then if I remember this correctly, I think Elamite actually recommended you to Macchio. Um, yes, he did. And he told you like you got to check out this night down guys, so and then you got picked up. How did that? How did that end up working out? Um, did they just approach you and say, "Hey, we saw you do really well," and then come join us? I actually went to a local land with Elamite and a, 
and two others, I believe. It was like me, Elamite, Puss in Boots, and Ace, I think was the team. It was something like that. And I remember Puss in Boots was like the guy who was kind of like my chaperone at these tournaments because I was still young and my parents weren't really too fond and they wanted an older figure and he was three years older than me. So it really helped out having someone who was, you know, a friend and met my parents and my parents trusted him to, you know, watch over me, take good care of me if I really needed something, like he would be there to help. And uh, we went to this tournament and I just played lights out and it was at the beginning of Halo 3 so like people are still trying to figure out new talent and trying to figure out who's going to be really good and I was just going off every single game and I remember even my literally like just like he would sit next he sat next to me and would stop playing and just like look over my screen and just be like wow like how are you hitting like some of these snipe shots and he told my friend um, Puss in Boots at the time that if any at that tournament at that local before I was even on instinct he said if anything ever happened to straight ripping I'm the first person that he's going to pick up and that's exactly what happened when neighbor left the team and yeah, he was yeah. like, he, he didn't even ask anyone else they I was the first person they asked and they asked me like four times because I told them no over and over and finally that they convinced me enough after I got into an argument with uh, that triggers down roster and they convinced me and I was like all right like let's do this so it, it all kind of just I don't know, my, my career is so backwards in some ways, but it's really cool how it all worked out. Because it's, it's like, it started off great, took a dive, and now it's great again, so it's yeah. been fun. Yeah, you're, it, uh, it almost, if, if somebody were to like write the story of your career without you actually having existed, people would say that's, it's preposterous. Like, yeah, there's it's no way this would happen. Weird. Um, weird. But you guys did really well at that event. I mean, you made it to the finals. Uh, so what was it like playing... Um, Playing victory because I mean I remember when you guys won, Macchio jumped up and was like, "Nice decision, Victory X. Good decision," because he had yeah. left and they were like best friends. So yeah. you, know, you played with uh, Roy Box, obviously you're teaming with now, uh, like this this duo that had been around for forever with 5K. So was that um, like playing on the main stage for the first time and stuff? What what was that kind of like for you? Did, did, you said you felt a little bit nervous there, but then it kind of got over it. Um, so can you what anything really really stand out for you from that event? Yeah. I I love teaming with uh, Roy and Lunchbox. They're great, great teammates, great communicators. They've always been like that. And I only got the pleasure to team with them for one tournament up until this past year where I finally got to team with them again. Mm -hmm. And I think the the only part that really made me nervous was Macchio because he was always like that figure over my shoulder that was like questioning the plays I'm making. Because he, he, if you don't know Macchio, he's very, very uh, head casey in yeah. terms of like <laughs> how he's like how he's like opinionated and like what he's thinking. And so. At the tournament, even after we beat like Victory X's team, and that was like a great victory for those guys. It didn't really mean as much to me because I didn't team with them, and it wasn't like he's a good friend or anything. It was just cool to get to that um, second place position. But even at the tournament, I was being talked about by like by like Macchio, and he, like he's telling other people that he doesn't think I'm good, and they're gonna drop me after this tournament. And I'm just like like I'm I'm hearing this stuff while I'm there, and so I'm just like this is like not. This is not really like what I expected or what I wanted, and we get we ended up getting second place, which is every single person on my team's best placing. No one had ever gotten second before, and Macchio still dropped me. And so it was just like I didn't. No one really agreed with that opinion. Like everyone, even on the forums back at the time, everyone was so upset that like how do how do how does a team that gets second place end up dropping a player that really like played extremely well at that tournament? I think me and Roy were like the two better two best players at that event yeah, specifically, sure. and. Um, Roy didn't even know that I got dropped. He got a phone call after it happened, and they were like, by the way, we dropped Snipe down. He's like, oh, well then. And then they end up picking back up victory, and this is where like the sweet revenge comes because Macchio dropped me five minutes before the pro roster deadline. And it's like, that was just like the shadiest move of all time because if I didn't find a team in those five minutes, I wasn't going to be on a pro team. So it was like everything I'd worked for was just like cut out because one guy didn't, I don't know. But I ended up getting picked up at Triggers Down. We ended up, Winning the next tournament, only dropping games to straight rip, and we threw out every team. We played Instinct at the next tournament, and I just remember that was just like, I'm gonna just dem demolish these these kids for for deciding to drop me after like after such a good placing, and we ended up three owing them very dominatingly, and it was just so satis satisfactory. <laughs> yeah, I I mean I I remember watching that tournament, and for me it's always if a team finishes second, you should never. Especially after your, after your first event, you got to at least give that roster yeah. one or two more lineups. But it seemed like there yeah, was a little event. bit. Yeah, it seemed like there was like a friendship issue there because he was such good friends with Victory, and you really wanted him back. That's the way I perceived it, at least at the time. I thought, well, they're best friends, so that's the only way that I can see this making sense. 
I didn't know what happened five minutes before the Raw. So I guess TD was in the same situation you were in. Where they're like, yeah, TD lost victory, and they were like, well, we need a player, and you're the only player. And I was like, okay, well, I'm on their team. And they're like, all right, we're submitting it. And it was like, and that was the decision. Like, it wasn't really, really like an actual, like, thought out, maybe we should go with this person or this person. It was like, we have to pick you up. Let's do this. Let's land. And then, like, we, we that's what happened. Like, it wasn't, it was kind of just like a trade in a way, but it was just un really not cool how it, how it all happened. I was just, like, devastated when they told me they were dropping me. It was awful. That, that does sound incredibly shady. I, I wasn't aware of that. And the, the thing that makes that even a little bit weirder is because at San Diego, you didn't only get second place, but you beat every single team in the top five that finished in the top five to get there. I mean, the only, yeah. the only way that tournament could have been more convincing of a second place was if you had, beat final, if you had played final boss instead of classic, maybe. But even yeah. then, that's arguable. Um, okay, so let's talk about this TD tournament then because you go and you guys win all of your first events ever. Um, so what... Walk us through this tournament a little bit. I mean, the first series, against, the finals against Straight was absolutely insane. Um, like you guys, you guys lose three to two in that first, the first half of the series, because uh, you guys had the the winners bracket advantage, obviously. And then you come back and just sweep them three nothing. There was that crazy onslaught flag game where you guys scored like oh, three, yeah, I think it was nuts. Three caps of like something like two minutes and thirty something ridiculous, and then they tie it up. So like as a, as a team of no, none of you had ever been in the finals. I don't think right. Like you were all new to the finals. So, yeah, I don't think so. Um, so how do you guys keep your composure in that scenario? Because not only did you just lose the first series and kind of your advantage is gone, but then you get off to this really great start and then that disappears from you too. It's the straight ties the game up 3-3 and you guys still managed to win that game. So was it just all of you guys are incredibly headstrong or because that's very that's very rare for a team of amateurs in that scenario to come out and actually out clutch a team that had such a such a story yeah. history. I feel like once you get to a certain point of being comfortable on a stage and just being like being okay with what's like going on around you i like as of today i don't think it's changed much since back in the day i do not i cut everything out i tunnel vision i only see my screen and hear only my teammates like that's i don't i don't hear anything else from outside and that's pretty much what happened honestly and that and that series against straight ripping like we lost the first series three two i think we had like one choke and we ended up losing the game five and after that we were just like guys like we land against final boss and we beat them at the LAN, and that was like a very big confidence boost because we were a newer team, and we knew going going against this straight ripping roster that we had the talent, we had the skill to beat them. And honestly, that series just felt like it was destined for me to win my first tournament because everything went my way. Like I would throw a sticky across the map, and I'd find yeah. someone. Like it was every single thing I did felt like it was the right move, and I was hitting just crazy shots, and it just I never once felt like the pressure was on us to do anything because. If anything, we weren't supposed to be there, and Straight Ripping was the one that had the pressure on them to defend their title, and they had to, you know, hold off the team of up and comers who were really coming at them as hard as they could. And I think that first best of five was just like, was kind of like a test for us because it would have been easy to fold, but there's no way that we were going to allow that to happen. And I wanted it so bad to just continue, like, continue, like, almost like a, like a run for success that I just like had wanted for so long and i was finally starting to achieve it and there's no way i was letting like another chance in the finals to go down that's like lebron losing his first three finals appearances like that'd be the worst thing ever like i couldn't i couldn't imagine getting to multiple finals and just getting second 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 like that would just be awful you never actually like tasted that victory and i just wanted that more than anything and i think the rest of our team did because of the fact that no one had ever won a tournament before so i think that if anything that only helped us yeah, you guys all played out of your minds during that. Yeah, season. that was SK's best event I've ever seen him play. Me, me too. I mean, I've gone back and been watching a lot of VODs recently of all the years, and I think that was by far I've ever seen SK play. Yeah, he played out of his mind. And yeah, you were. I mean, you were throwing stickies without even seeing people. I think he even Puckett, yeah. Puckett even said it at one point. He's like, "Halo just wants snipe down to yeah, win." Yeah, I remember. I had like, oddball and elbow. He's like, "The yeah. game wants snipe down to win." I was like, "It really does at this point." Like, it was just everything. <laughs> it was cool. Yeah. So this team, I mean, it was. It seemed to be. When I, I remember watching the event thinking, like, this team is going to be the best team ever because you guys had yourself and Hysteria who were quickly proving yourselves to be, like, the two top players. The top five players in the game at that point in time, oh, for sure. I, I would even say maybe two of the top three. Uh, maybe. You guys, you guys were both playing out of your minds. And with the snipers, just the threats that you guys had on that team. So what... Because I, I heard you mention in your interview with Walshy that it was a long story as to why you left, and you get this question a lot, like, why would you leave this team after... Um, so why, what, what did make you, you know, consider leaving? <laughs> Attitudes. Uh, there were a lot of, I was, I was a lot, I was young at the time, and at that age, I wanted friends, 
because I had built so many friendships because I'd played Halo for so long. And so, like, anyone I'd really played with, like, even with, like, the amateur players that I used to play with back in the day before I became a pro, like, I was always, like, friends with them before anything. I never, like, took anything that competitively up until a certain point. But when I was on that team, like, I got along with Fear itself pretty well. SK is one of the funniest people I've ever met. But me and Hysteria clashed a lot because we just had two different personalities. Um, and I remember, I remember telling my team that straight ripping because after that tournament is when they were left to for final boss yep. um final boss actually asked yeah. me to team with them and i said no to them because i didn't think they were as good as the team i currently had and it would have been all like final boss like ah oh, like yeah, whatever yeah. but it would have been great to be a part of that team but i just i said no straight ripping contacted me i said no i told my team about what was happening uh they didn't respond how i thought they would like they were like mad at me for getting offers and i was like i just said no to both these teams, like, like, what, why, like, are you serious? Like, if anything, like, you should be glad I'm, like, telling you this kind of stuff. I'm being straight up with you. And we, we played, like, we played online after that. And I, I had told Straight Up and No, like, for, like, two days straight. And we played online after that and had a scrim. And it was, like, it was, like, a stereo's host or something. And he was pulling host. And I complained about us losing a game because we lost for, like, eight seconds or something in a pit King of the Hill game. And I remember, I remember I said something. I was like, man, dude, I was like, this one kid got away from me so bad. I was like, your host is so terrible, Jacob. And he just freaked out on me. Like freaked out, and I was like, "I'm done with you." I was like, I'm, I, I told them in game. I was like, "I'm calling straight ripping right now. I'm leaving this team." And SK tried to call me right away. I was like, "Dude, no." I was like, "I'm, I'm done with this team. Like, I cannot handle someone who has an attitude like that." And I left. I told him I was joining straight ripping, and then straight ripping was telling me that they were that my triggers down team was trying to drop me at the time as well. And they said that they were trying to that Elamite was getting offers from triggers down from my position. And I was like, this can't be real. Like, this is a joke. This is really about to happen again. And he was like, don't worry. He's like, I'm telling you this because I want to join our team. So <laughs> it ended up working out really well. Got the Dr. Pepper sponsor teamed with some some of the uh, people I've been looking up to for a while. So it just all ended up working out nicely. And to this day, that straight up and roster is still very high up there in, the ter- in my favorite teams and favorite people I've ever been a, uh, had the pleasure to team with. So worked out perfectly yeah it definitely did so let's just touch on this final boss offer for a second because you had recently just teamed with um you know, roy and lunchbox and in halo 3 they actually became the superior twins and if you had told anybody that in 2007 they probably would have called you insane yeah. so do you think do you think do you have any insight as to maybe why this happened like what what how did roy box become better than ogre one and two was it just the ogres not being as good at halo 3 i think dan had a lot of real life stuff he, i feel like he was established to a point where he was comfortable with where he was at and he had a girlfriend at the time who wanted to move to australia and so i think that had a lot of influence on how much time and dedication he was able to put into the game i don't think by any means that if ogre 2 and ogre 1 had stuck together and really put the time in that they used to put into halo 2 because they played non-stop they were always just like they wanted to be the best at all times and i think that kind of like took a dive in a little a little bit at the beginning of halo 3 because of that because of what was going on in the personal life, and that's completely understandable. That happens with everyone when personal life comes into the play and comes into play. But those are the two. Like together, over one and over two have like an average placing of like one point five or something, just like absurd, like that. So I think Roy and Lunch just just came in and they wanted that like satisfaction to take over and i think that's just what ended up happening because like i said if over one stuck around he would have been he could still be around and probably still be playing to the same level that um tom is yeah they made like something like 27 mlg finals in a row i think yeah, that's, a, say, that's unbelievable it's just something absolutely ridiculous um so when actually this i've interviewed a few people now who have teamed with hysteria and there's kind of this consensus i, I know that it doesn't sound like you two are the exactly the best of friends but i want to get this um see if this rings true to you too a lot of people say that to team with hysteria you have to he's very like very very smart when he does say things about the game they tend to be right but his delivery is not the best and it kind of it can you have to, you have to have like a, a a certain demeanor or personality to be able to team with him Would that would that be something that you'd agree with yeah i'd agree with that completely i think um i think he is very intelligent in terms of knowledge of the game i don't think that he approaches situations in a like constructive way i think it's very destructive i think if you have a personality type that is defensive which i've 
done this with teammates before that if like it, if someone talks to you like they're talking down to you you respond with like you you defend yourself like you're just like why are you talking to me like this like i've actually like gotten like very heated with a team that, with some teammates before i'm not going to say who but um just with I, and i told him i was like i was like if you want to tell me something about this you need to like be more constructive about it because if you make me feel like i'm stupid for making a certain play i'm gonna freak out on you because i know I, he's like i'm smart at this game i know what i'm doing and that's just like how it needs to be handled because you, you you need to be positive when you're t like if, you're, if you're trying to construct someone just be like hey man this play works out nicely like this this you can do that in some situations but we, we were here and we were here you need to tell us this and you need to handle the situation this way so then the the um, the play can fold out a different way, but with the way it is, it's like that was the stupidest play I've ever seen. Why would you make that push? It's like, what does that help? That only just starts conflict, and that those are the kinds of things that you know our team has eliminated. We don't have the only time you ever hear that with our team is with the Rolling Lunch because they're twins and it's a brotherly bond. Like it's not like that. If they weren't brothers, like they wouldn't say that to anyone. And you know, like that's why I think our team is so strong. It's because we do have those types of connections and we're very productive when we do practice together. Yeah, do you think that that's kind of maybe just the because now everybody's so much older, right? Like you guys are, it's basically the same crew of people that are still playing. Like there's not very many faces around today that were completely not around back then. So do you think that was maybe just like an age thing where everybody's 16, 17, 18 people are not quite, um, not quite developed and mature enough yet to know how to, because the, the, like you said, the delivery of the message is just as important as the message itself, right? Yeah, correct. I think, um, I think, yeah, I think a lot of it does come with maturity. Over time, I know, I know, I used, like, I've said this before multiple times, I used to have a terrible attitude, and it really hurt me. I think during the reach days is why, a big part of the reason why I played so ter so terribly for my standards. I was getting top six, top eight all the time, and it really, that was, that was a rough time, and I, I think at the time, like, I, I, I kind of, like, held myself to a higher standard, and it really kind of hurt me in the end because I wasn't respecting my teammates enough, and I was almost overconfident with myself and my abilities that it really hindered and held back my growth as a player and i think as soon as i started playing like halo 4 and i changed my attitude like i just became twice the player i was when i was on top in halo 3 um i think in halo 3 i was the most individually skilled player but i was not the best teammate i was not the best communicator there were many parts of my of my game that were slacking and i think now that those have been like molded and completed together that it has turned me into a completely different player i don't think i play anything like i used to back then um i may snipe similar but that's about it and i think with our team in general that that maturity factor has become a huge issue because you know they the twins have teamed with roy or the twins have teamed with um ogre two and they've seen like what he's done and his paths to success and you know he they know like how to handle situations and they know how to improve and that's one of the biggest things with us is is being able to improve and you look at us from the first tournament when we team with Pistola compared to the last tournament and we're the team that we, we doubled in skill and other teams either stayed stagnant or they they got worse and it's just like I think that is all determined by how we perceive the game in our practice schedule so yeah for sure you guys have gotten so much better since the first tournaments I mean there was a little while there that you guys didn't drop a game for something like two online cups and yeah we dropped one game in three events pretty much yeah yeah it was, it was, it was pretty insane how much better you guys got um, so let's talk about Straight Rippin' now. Uh, this made you actually, joining Straight Rippin' made you the first player in Halo 3 to win back-to-back -back events. Uh, I think it didn't happen again until TD in 09 with Dallas and Anaheim, if I recall correctly. Um, but you were the first player to do this. Uh, so what, what was it about this team that just, you guys gelled so well? Because, I mean, when you guys, when you go back and watch that Toronto event, it was just, it was complete domination. And uh, that, that final boss series especially, that was the best series, I think, of the yeah, whole tournament. Sure. You guys go down to nothing, and then you come mount the reverse sweep. Did Tom, you know, did T2, was he, like, firing you guys up, like, hey, we can't lose to Mason? Like, what what, what was that series like? Because that must have been, especially because you didn't know the history and what had just happened. Um, yeah, Mason actually called me out before that series, and I didn't really understand why he called me out, considering that I was only the person that decided to take his spot because he left. It's not like he got dropped and I took his spot. I think he almost felt a little threatened by me at the time. Because he, you know, he had this, he had the light and um, the the starlight for a while, and then as soon as I came into the scene, I really kind of took that from him real quick because he was having that at the end of Hill through, at, at the end of Hill two and the beginning of Hill three, and then at the beginning of Hill three, that's when like my reign started. And I think he felt a little threatened by that, and that's why he called me out and was always like trying to like gun for me and was trying to like prove that he was a better player than me. 
And I know for my team at the time, with like Legit, T2, and Elamite, they, all they wanted to do was just beat Mason so bad because they felt very betrayed that he would leave them after getting first place and second place. Like they, I don't think there was a reason for him to leave and make a team change. I don't really understand the whole process behind that because he was such good friends with them as well. So I think it really hurt their feelings a lot when he did deti- decide to leave because it was, it was just like out of nowhere. Like he didn't talk to anyone. It was just like he's gone. Like what the hell? And I know Tom. Tom felt like he lost like his best friend in that whole situation. I know. I know they they didn't want anything more. Like that was a, the tournament victory for them at that point. And then after that, it was just like it was like, well, we beat them. Now we clicked on like another level because they knew right as soon as we beat Neighbor that they could be just as good, if not better, with me than they ever were with Neighbor. And that's kind of like a comfortable feeling that they got. And I think it all worked out really nicely because I felt very comfortable on that team after that point. And um, we all got along extremely well, and uh, I think that was another huge reason as, as to why we had so much success. And I think we started to really fold when we all we started to kind of, you know, start in 2000, late 2009, early 2010. We started to just like not really get along as much. There were just things that were conflicting with us, and that's really when our tournament placing started to drop heavily. Yeah, because I mean, for the for the remainder of 2008, you guys were by far the best team on the circuit. Um, I, you guys lost that one event to TD in that crazy, crazy series. Yeah, that was insane. It, yeah, but it, it, overall, I mean, the you guys were a really dominant team. Um, somebody else I want to talk to you about, just from Toronto, really fast, actually, is Soviet because he's a player that, like you, kind of came out of nowhere. It seemed, and at the beginning of Halo Three, but unlike you, he didn't seem to make it stick around. Like if the uh, the the whole the, all the hype was that you know you and Soviet were coming up and. You guys were going to be the new versions of Neighbor and Strong Side, just these ridiculously talented players. Uh, but he kind of tapered off. So do you know anything about him? Do you know why he didn't? Not really. I don't really know too much about Soviet. I know he was, he was without a doubt, the best player ever when it comes to lands. Like, if you were, like, in a basement or if you were just, like, playing against another team not at a tournament, dude would just outskill everyone. It was the most insane thing I've ever seen. Then you get him into a tournament situation where, like, his mind gets clouded. He can't make the decisions he's making. He doesn't shoot the same. Like that, he was the biggest difference when it comes to tournament and land player I've ever seen. But he was still good on land. But when he played the top teams, his play style just got shut down. Like he was the guy who's going to flank every single time, and that's how he got so many kills. At, at like, uh, that's that's how that's his play style. When you play good teams, like you're watching the flank, you know exactly what he's going to be doing. And I don't ever think he had a good game against us when I was on straight ripping. I remember one game he went. 8 and 32 with least hill time in the finals and that was the last game of the finals where we beat instinct and it was like oh uh, that can't happen <laughs> and <Yeah. laughs> it was, that, that was actually at the toronto finals yeah, uh, yeah. That, that game i remember that so specifically i was just like what that's... what like nate 24 least hill time that's rough yeah and I... yeah because i've heard that a lot that he was like this really ridiculous player on land but he just couldn't yeah. So I guess he was like the definition of somebody really the, the nerves got the better of him at the events. Yeah, I'd say so for sure. You kinda look like you'd get nervous when you watch the rebroadcast and you'd like see his like player cam and whatnot. He just kinda seemed like he was uncomfortable. Yeah. Um okay, so let's just kind of talk about the rest of 08 really fast. I mean, you guys what what do you think made you guys so good? I mean, you guys were incredible on the pit as well. Uh, that was probably your best map, I think it's safe to say. But is there anything in particular that stands out? Do you think that you guys were just like the four best players? at your, like, in your respective kind of... In Halo 3, people really like to use, like, the role classifications. Like, there's the main slayer, the sniper, the support objective players. Do you guys think you had, like, the best combination of that? Like, wh- what do you think made you guys so dominant? I think, I mean, that, uh, that's kind of a way... I don't really like to use the word roles. Just what we're best at in, ta- in general, I guess, is different. Um, but I think that we, were, we all just wanted it more than anyone else. I think we had more drive than any other team. I think we also got along a lot better, so... When we heard when we heard certain callouts, we knew which ones were the stressed callouts, and we knew which ones to react to faster than other teams, because of us being on such good terms with each other, and that really helped out because you could distinguish voices very quickly, and you could pick that player out in game and know how to like react and do what's best to you know help that player out, and I think that was um, kind of the biggest factor for us in that in that early stage and. You know, we never really got down ourselves. We'd lose a game. We'd be like, all right, we got this next one. We wouldn't even talk about the last game that happened. We would just go right into the next game thinking what we need to do to win. And I think we just all had very good heads on our shoulders, which was very helpful in a game that is um, a lot of, a lot, you have to be, be very mentally strong to be good at. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, I mean, you guys, like, you lost in Dallas, that insane series. I mean, there was that 50-49 Narrows game. I think it was game two of the first yeah. series that would have you guys won that it was one kill difference. 
Um, did you guys were you guys worried about TD going into the going into Vegas in in, in 08? Like, was it was anybody or were you like, no, nah, that series was a fluke? Because you actually lost two pick games in that series, which is like, I don't know if you guys ever lost more than two pick games in a tournament that I saw. So that was kind of really strange. Yeah, we actually land them before that Dallas tournament, and I think that the reason they were able to play us so strongly on that is because of that land, and we knew after that that we didn't want to land them anymore because <laughs> they beat us every they beat us every single time on Pit Slayer, and we beat them every single time on Amp Slayer. And game ten was Pit Slayer, game eleven was Amp Slayer, and we were never going to get to game eleven. So when we played them on the pit to lose the tournament, it was like, all right, we've never beaten them on this. We just played them. 15 times at the land and we didn't beat him once like we just have to play this like a certain way and i was so close i, I still just like i may have been making some clutch shots but i still regret like there's one play if there's one play that i wish i could take back ever it would be jumping from top turret to try to, to go to, to training. training yeah it was yeah the worst play ever. i can't believe i made that play if i could have just sat top turret there was a guy lifting up that i would have sniped this is such a bad play i would have had such a better angle and everything i don't know i was trying to do it all because I wasn't missing, and I was like, I can, I can go, I can go wherever I want. And I'll hit whatever shot I take, and I was just like, yeah. I was so in the zone. And that's just the, that's the one play I wish I could take back for my entire career. So, but yeah. I mean, it, I think that if anything, it could have been a good thing that we lost that tournament, so we didn't get complacent, and we knew that what we had to do to come out and win Vegas, which is exactly what we did, because we won Vegas pretty, uh, pretty dominatingly. Yeah, I, I honestly think that was probably that that series and the the instinct. I mean, the uh, final boss classic series of Meadows in the finals. I think those were the two best series of the entire year. I mean, yeah, because you guys were down five kills almost the entire game, and then you tied it up forty five forty five. I think you were on like an eight or a nine kill spree, a sniper spree at the end there. Yeah. And then oh, it was. So when you go to when you went to Vegas, I mean. Um, Talk to us a bit about that, because that was the big tournament. I mean, that was a hundred grand. You guys take that home. Uh, I think you mentioned after Vegas that you bought a car, like a sports yeah. car or something. So, you know, talk to us a bit about that event. I mean, were you, did you feel nervous at all there because it was more money, or was it still like, nah, just I don't even think I thought about the money. I, I, I can't even remember thinking about I'm playing for a hundred grand. I was still too young at the time to even really appreciate money to a certain extent compared to where I'm at now, where it's like I'm playing to like make a living. But then I was just, I was just, I was still playing to just prove myself and just prove that I could, I'm the best. Like I wanted to prove that I was the best all the time, and it, whether whether that was both individually and as a team, that's all I wanted. I just wanted people to like respect the player I was. Cause after being hated on for so long at the beginning, of, at like throughout all Halo Two, I was like, that's really just what I wanted. And um, I really think that alone was a huge factor into why we like why we were successful. Because in the series versus Carbon at Vegas, they were the toughest team we played, for sure, we landed against them, we landed against them before Vegas, they were very good at the land, we knew they were going to do well at the tournament, and there was one game, we went down, we went down 1-0, won the second game, because we were down like, we were down like 13 kills or something in the second yeah. game, and we came back and won, I went on a, I went on a 10 spree, it was a crazy comeback. Yeah, I went on like a killing frenzy or something to bring it back, and then there was one play I made where I spot you because you spawn in the bases with people on amplified slayer it just happened all the time yeah. and i spawned in the same base as shockwave and he got the first two shots on me i dropped out front threw the best grenade i've ever thrown ever and it bounced off like the side because box grenades were not easy you had to reach hit b and then flick the joystick on where you wanted the grenade to go and i, I threw it perfectly it landed right under his feet i killed him and then got a double kill and then killed another guy to win the game like 50 48 it was the most ridiculous, ridiculous series of events that happened, and like, I'll still joke with Shockwave about that. He's like, dude, that was, that's, he's like, you won your team the game with that nade. And he's like, it was the best grenade I've ever seen. He's like, I can't believe I chased you. I was like, yeah, dude, I don't know. I was like, yeah, I don't know what happened, but um, we ended up winning that series 3-2, and then after that is when he played Instinct, and then Instinct beat Carbon, and then we knocked Instinct out, and we were happy about that. We didn't want to play Carbon again, and uh, we ended up beating Instinct, I think, 6-3 in the finals. Yeah, it was much more, con it was pretty convincing. Um, yeah. So let's so after after these finals, I mean, I think at this point, straight straight Rippin was probably the biggest esports team or name in North America at that point. I mean, you guys had the Dr Pepper Gaming House. T two was on Dr Pepper bottles. Did this start like did because oh nine obviously wasn't quite as successful for you guys. So do you think this start this sort of stuff started to like get into your head like oh look at us we're like um, you know we're the superstars or was it, what do you think like what what, no, what was that like? I know exactly what the reason of our downfall was but it was more just the personal decisions we were making outside of the game 
Um, we, we were not making smart choices in terms of what was going to benefit us in terms of the team. And when we did move into the house together, yeah, it was one of the best times I've had in my life. But we were all young. We were stupid. We were just having a good time all the time. Weren't taking practice, like, as seriously, you know, like, and it, it, it hurt us. And it showed, obviously. We were, like, fourth, first, fourth, second, sixth, I think, were our placings that season. Yeah. It was just not good for us. Um. Pretty much that sums up the entire season of our placings. <laughs> it was just the personal decisions we were making. I still think we had the talent. We had enough. Um, I think we had enough skill for sure to compete. And we won the we won the second tournament. It was very dominating really because I think that tournament we decided to you know take serious. And then after that we were like, oh, we're good. We can just turn it on whenever. And it just bit us in the ass. And that's pretty much. That's pretty much the downfall of straight ripping was the straight ripping house. <laughs> it, was, it was fun, though. I still enjoy it. I, I look back and I had a great time. So. so it was just maybe a little bit too much partying, too much... Yeah, I'd, yeah, I'd say so. I'd say it was definitely just the personal decisions we were making as a team <laughs> to not benefit us. But you, know, you can't live in the past. It was fun. I still wouldn't take it back. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I think at that point, because you guys didn't have like a... Normal esports teams now, like if you live in a gaming house, you have like the coach or the manager or some, you have right. some like authoritative parental figure there. Yeah, there was no content, there was no streaming. If there was that kind of stuff, we would have been streaming all the time, but there was just nothing like, there was, it was, it was just practice online and go to tournaments. It wasn't really anything else, and it was just five guys all around the same age living together in a house where like we're all on, we're, we're on our own, we're all away from our parents, like just. Let's have a good time all the time. That's pretty much our motto. So, <laughs> had you graduated high school at that point, or I, I had graduated high school. It was in my freshman year of college. Is when I had this house in. Oh, okay. Freshman year of college, I kind of didn't really take that serious, and was always uh, I was always flying to the straight open house all the time. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, because I was gonna say if that was in high school, that would have been really a challenge. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, with 09 not going so well, I mean, but I, you guys had glimpses. Like you said, you came first in Columbus and then second in Anaheim, I believe it was, right? Yeah. So you guys had, like, these glimpses of, oh, no, wait, that's 08 straight. They're still there. Um, and then, obviously, in 09, that's probably one of the most controversial events ever. There was the whole Heinz Xbox thing turning off, and uh, you guys lost to Believe the Hype, who obviously played very well that tournament. They won the whole thing, but did that really, like, shock you guys? Uh, what? Like, oh, yeah, I'd say so. I think we... I think we went up 2-0 in that series and ended up losing 3-2. And that was just the most demoralizing, frustrating series ever. Because Game 5, I was going off. We were up at like 10, and we ended up choking so hard. And like we were up like 46-42, and we ended up losing. Like It was 46-42. We were all alive, all four in their base. And we went four dead without getting a kill on Narrow Slayer. And that's like impossible. Like You have to try to try to lose for that to happen. And we just, we lost, and I couldn't believe it, and we lost, like, 50-47 or 50-48 or, or something like that, and after that, like, we instantly had to go into our next series, we ended up getting, like, 3 0 by Carbon, and it was just like, well, that's that, we're pretty much done with, and that's when, like, we all knew, like, we weren't going to stick together after a performance like that at finals. Like, we were guaranteed top six, and we got sixth. Like, we, it, was, it was unbelievable, it was, it was the worst. <laughs> the worst. Yeah, that's it was all our fault too, though, because we land three times before that tournament against three average top twelve teams, and that made us so much worse because we didn't play against top teams. Like you, you get into bad habits because you play against worse teams that you can get away with things, and yeah. against top teams that isn't going to work, and that's what happened. And we got sloppy, and it hurt us, and clearly it did not benefit us at all. Landing more, more practice is not good compared to better practice. I would rather have the same practice I have with my team now than land three times against average teams to, and be a lot more confident with that other practice. So, was there a reason that you didn't land any top teams? Was it like, oh, we're scared? I think, it's because, of the, I think it's because of what happened back in when we land triggers down and they beat us at that, <laughs> and they beat us at that tournament in 2008. And after that, we were just like, well, we don't want to land a top team because they're just going to take all our strats and going to beat us at these game types. But we definitely didn't think about playing a worse team, playing multiple worse teams. It was so... We actually landed that classic team that got second at that tournament. They got so much better from that land, and we did not... I don't know. It was, it was very frustrating, very unfortunate. Yeah, so do you think if you guys had gotten, like, second or first, that that lineup would have stayed together? Because that was such a fan-favorite yeah. lineup, and... You, I well, mean, yeah, no questions asked. We would have stayed together if we got second or first. We were told by... Like, Dr. Pepper was so disappointed because they told us if we had gotten, like... If we had gotten, like, a top three placing they had something like huge for us that they had planned out but we ended up just 
blowing that away too. So it was that good. Uh, so that, was, that was probably one of the more depressing moments of my Halo career. Was that sixth place finish? Actually, I think that is the most depressing moment of my Halo career. <laughs> I think that was your worst finish actually since your first event. Like your, your uh, yeah, first no, event. yeah, it was at that time. That was my worst finish in two years. Yeah, it was my first event. That was my worst finish. That was that was rough. And then everything went downhill from there. <laughs> so you guys ended up swapping out Elamite for Heinz. Now, was this like one of your decisions? Did you guys like how did how did this like how did you guys decide that Elamite was the guy that had to go? Because um, watching that tournament, it didn't seem like there was never like games where I was like, oh, this guy's got to go. Like he, he, this is the this is the worst one. It just kind of seemed like like you said, like it was all of you were not playing up to your your usual standards. So how did that how did that decision come to be? I think some of the he was making some personal decisions that we didn't get that we didn't um approve of and that really affected us and we kind of like pinned that on his gameplay. But I don't think his gameplay was ever the issue. I think it was more so of us just not approving of things outside the game. And pretty much I think we just we tried to find a reason as to what was going wrong and we blamed it on him and it was not his fault and as you could see with his success in 2010 without us I definitely was not his fault I think a lot of I think I think Brian was going through a lot of stuff at that time and he definitely stopped really putting as much effort into the game as he could have and it really um, I think he was the best player in 2008 and I think it slowly declined um, over time and I definitely could tell that he just wasn't enjoying it as much and if you're not enjoying the game you're playing then you're not going to like you're not going to want to play it and you're just not going to be as good as as you can be, and that's that's one of the biggest things. I think, like, I've, like, I've been successful for the past, like, two-plus two, two plus years with Halo 4 and now this game, and I think it's because, like, you know, I, Halo 4 may not have been, like, the most competitive game, but I was winning, so I enjoyed it. Like, I was like, yeah. well, I'm going to enjoy the game, I'm winning. I'm not going to complain, but I'm not going to be like, I hate this game, but I'm winning. Like, that's just... And, like, now this... Like, Halo 2 Anniversary, I love this game so much, and I think that's why, like, our whole team loves this game, and it really helps us because... If you love the game you're playing, then you're gonna want to play. And like we play it to play it. Like we don't play it just to get on and practice as a team. Like we play because we like the game, and it really helps. And I think that was um a big reason. I think we lost a lot of the spark that we had as a team on straight ripping at that time because we just weren't enjoying playing and competing as much together. And I think that's why like I needed to take a break from the straight ripping team because I wanted to find that again on another team. Which the BTH was not the was not the choice for that i could wish i would have found a different team i wish i would have joined instinct with elamite because it could have been me elamite rolling lunch that would have been nasty yeah and that oh my gosh i don't even want to get into the, the possibility this is another reason hysteria has just bugged me this this team was just the god squad and it was as soon as 2009 ended it was supposed to be me pistola heinz and hysteria that was the team. That was like what was planned out. We had thought about that this whole time. It was like, dude, me, he me Heinz, and, P and Pistola were voted the top three players in the game at the end of 2009 by all the pros, and it was supposed to be us three and Mysteria, who has always been a great Halo 3 player. And Jacob was like, I want a team with SK. And I'm just like, dude, you can't do this. Like, it, you, <laughs> you, can't, you can't turn this team down. Like, this is like, this is, this would have been the first real God squad since, like, Final Boss 2007. Like, that team had the potential to just sweep everybody all the time. I don't think there's been, like, in terms of, like, on paper, that team... Yeah, that I sounds still just like, oh, my God, dude. I, I still just think about it. I'm just like, dude, how did you turn this team down? And I think it's just because Heinz, Heinz and Ola were young, and they didn't really know how to approach the situation. They felt like they didn't have a say with Hysteria. And so I don't even know if Jacob even really knew about it because of that, but... Man, I just, that's, that's just, if there was one team I wish I could have formed, it would have been that one at the time, because that team would have just, that is like, that was like a dream team for me at that time. Yeah, I mean, that sounds like a Halo 3 superstar lineup. I mean, yeah. it's, Heinz was objective player of the year in 2009, right, by the pro, yeah. pro choice. Him and Ola just blew up in 2009, and then yeah. was there, and I've just, I was just like, dude, us four together, that's just what I wanted. That TD squad in 09 was really, really impressive. Yeah. Um so let's talk about the very beginning of straight for just a few seconds for 2010 uh, straight because you guys swapped out Elamite for Heinz and on paper this looked like okay you took one of the better objective players in the game in Elamite Warrior and subbed him out for the best objective player in the game in Heinz like on paper this should have been a perfect like this should have this technically yeah, brought right back so was it just uh, when I spoke with Heinz when he did this he said that the feeling he got was you and him were playing and committed and it seemed like T2 and legit were not that yeah, a sentiment that's you share? Pretty, uh, accurate. That's pretty accurate. For sure. 
So you think it was just a commitment thing? Basically? It was hundred percent a commitment thing. I don't, I don't, like I said, I, I feel like a lot of the, of the drive and that spark that they had to play and compete to be the best was gone. Um, but they've been playing both like legit and T like T squared since '04. I think legit's been around since '06. I want to say with Storm Ventures. I'm not sure yeah. if he was around before then. I, I can't recall. Well, I, like I said, I think there were some personal things going on that were that were always mentally bothering them. And I think that was a big a big issue, and it was for sure me and Hines that always just were just like, what's going on? Like we should be destroying these people, and we were just not at all. And it was because of like the commitment level and what they were actually like. They weren't getting better. It, it was more of playing to play, not playing to improve, or playing like as a team to get better. And that was probably the biggest issue because we our growth like we didn't get any better as a team when we were on that team, and it, it sucked because Richie got the blame. And it was not his fault at all. It was not his fault at all. And then I didn't know what to do after that. I think he, I don't know what team Richie left to go join. I think me and Richie might have both yeah. left to go to BTH. You both, yeah, you both left to join BTH with Maniac and I forget whether it was Tazoxic. I think it was Tazoxic. Tazoxic. And yeah. then Richie left for Dynasty after the Wait, one. No, no, it was, uh, it was Destin. It was me, Heinz, Demon D, and Maniac, I think was the team. Hold on. Let me, let me double check. We it was me, Heinz, Demon D, and Maniac. And then we dropped Richie after that tournament because yeah. he plays terribly and picked up Tazoxic. Yeah. You guys did even worse. Doing, man, I was so bad at making team decisions at that time. <laughs> you guys ended up doing even worse. Sounds awful. Yeah, so um, so 2010 and 2011 were kind of the dark years of your career, I guess. Oh, yeah, 100%. Say. I was really questioning if I even wanted to continue at that point because I was like, man, this is this is rough. But I was like, I know I'm still good. I think, And then that's when I was really like, I need to change something about myself to start improving and i think that's when i really was like i need to change my attitude like my attitude is causing me to like get frustrated in games and like i'll see if someone make a play that i don't approve and i'll just be like oh like i won't say anything like i'll just like i'll just act like a child and i feel like my attitude has definitely just improved so much now that it has definitely like skyrocketed me as a player and an individual as like even just in general like even it's just like a human just a person even outside a game it's just really helped out so did somebody close to you kind of give you a kick in the butt and be like, what are you doing here? Or was it just completely, because I mean, it was just my own. Yeah. It was just my own. It was like, it was like, what are you doing? How are you placing here? Look back at what happened and why, where did it really start to take a turn? And it really started to take a turn when everyone's attitudes just started getting just worse and worse and worse. And like, it was, it was always an excuse as to why we were doing bad. It was never like, well, maybe we're doing something wrong. It was just an excuse as to why I did something bad. And I was like, I was like, man, I need to stop making excuses for failure and start accepting it and realizing there's something that needs to change. And then that's just when I really looked back and I was like, man, ever since my attitude really just like, ever since I got like almost like full of myself and I, I got overconfident in, in my abilities and I thought that I could just like single handedly do things on my own and it just really hurt me. And then now that like I, I want my teammates always there to help. I like, I respect like, like teamwork more than, any type of individual skill anymore so it's it's definitely just just changing how my thought process worked for sure you know, that's incredibly rare for somebody a you were like what 1920 at that time and then at, i mean in esports there's very very few cases where you hear i follow quite a few esports and there's very few cases where you hear about somebody who's gone from a, a negative attitude or a bad attitude to a good attitude i don't even know how many players i could list in in all games that i follow that that's been uh, story for so for for you to do that i mean i guess that shows why uh i guess that shows why you're kind of back on top of everything um so talk, let's just talk a little bit about reach we don't have to dwell on this for too long because it obviously wasn't the uh, I, yeah i've blacked I, that out from my mind <laughs> i I'm, I'm i'm sure you have so you kind of were on a few different teams did you ever really feel like any of these teams could win i mean maybe carbon or elite four at the end of the year when you got you got a couple second places uh but they were in agls um, I, say, I don't think um, if I go if I look at my reach teams, I actually thought the team that Carbon team it was me, Assault, Blaze, and Ryan Noob. Thought I thought that team had so much potential, and we did. We could have we played we could have played any team up to game five every single time, and we had a ton of potential on that team. We just choked. We choked so hard. We lost at that tournament we played. We lost two game five countdown slayers both times, and it was like just the plays that happened at the end. I just like I'm just like picturing them. I was just like, oh man, just so rough. And we definitely had the potential to win. We only played one tournament together, and then I think that was the end of really like reach. I think that was the the la the only no bloom no sprint tournament was when I was with that team, and then it was done. And then I never thought that elite four roster was capable of really winning tournaments. I, I don't. I mean, we were good, but that t the instinct roster that we played had stopped playing at that point in time. 
Um, and we still like we we actually beat them in games. We were won like five four, but they ended up winning the tournament because it wasn't a continuation. Yeah. But uh, I don't really take that. I take that pretty lightly in terms of in terms of placements. Um, I don't really think that team, if it was an MLG tournament, would have really placed top two. We were we were good, but we weren't that good. If teams were playing, I don't think we would have been amazing. Yeah. So was there anything about Reach that like really like you've obviously talked about your attitude and that you know not contributing to maybe why you were uh, contributing to why you weren't so successful? But was there something maybe about the game itself that you were like, man, this game isn't as fun for me? Or um. I don't know. I I think I really just didn't enjoy the game as much. And like I said, like if you don't enjoy the game you're playing, like you just I don't know. It, there's something about that. Every time I've heard anyone say they don't enjoy the game they're playing, I I don't think they've ever been a top player. Like it's just it's right away that I'm just like, well, if you don't like the game you're playing, how are you going to be good at the game? Like it's like you know I don't hear people complaining about Call of Duty. Everyone that plays Call of Duty loves the game. Like they love it to the to the end. And um, I just, I really just think that maybe Reach just like was not my game. I don't really feel like I was that bad individually. I just think that I didn't put myself on the right teams to kind of like work around in the right attitudes because a lot of the attitudes that I had on my team were very negative and that only made my attitude worse at the time. And so it was finally when I started getting on uh, on teams with good attitudes, which I think, I think the only, I can like, look back and think that like my success comes from a lot of good players quitting because that finally gave me the opportunity to get back on a good team like all the top players quitting for Halo 4 like it was like the whole instinct roster left like it was I think Roy, Lunch, Ogre 2 all them left like Fear Itself left like so many top players left and I was like well I'm picking up Heinz Pistola and Formal well, let's just make a god squad like right away I was like I'm back like I'm on a team with these <laughs> like, attitudes like I was just so hyped to start playing again I was like man I was like like this is probably gonna work out for the best and it really did because ever since like I've been considered a top player again and uh, I've had power to you know kind of pull players like when when Halo 2 Anniversary first started that PAX event um, I was considered one of the top players, and then we ended up getting placing very poorly on that optic roster. But right after that, I was like, I was like, I knew Roy wasn't going to want to continue teaming with the team he had because he didn't think he could really win with them. And I was like, Roy, I was like, let's team. He's like, we're he's like, let's do it. He's like, and then it was me, Roy, and Pistola, and that trio right there was really where we were like, we have really good stand, a really good chance to get any player we want. And at that time, Lunchbox, Lunchbox even said to Roy, he's like, he's like, I'm only coming back if I have a team I can win with, and I can win with this team, and um, I think that's really where that all started. So I think I think if anything, I can attribute to a lot of my success to thank you for quitting everybody. <laughs> uh, but I think I think it ended up would working out somewhat similar in the end, no matter what, because um, I was definitely improving myself or yeah. trying to prove myself over and over again. Well, I mean, you definitely sound like you have a very uh, a very accurate or object. You have the ability to be very accurate and objective with kind of what. That's it, which is very important for self improvement in any in any uh, discipline. Mm -hmm. So let's just quickly go over Halo Four because I mean it was in your most dominant game by far in terms yeah. of placings. You had one second, one fourth, and everything else was a victory. Um, so why did you guys drop APG for uh, Pistola when it's a second in a first place? Whenever teams do that well and then drop somebody, I'm always kind of curious, like what what was going on there? Why why change the why change what's working? I don't, I don't, honestly, I don't even think that team decision was, like, meant necessary at all. I think we would have continued our success with APG. I think it was just because, like, I had always wanted a team with Pistola, um, and I know Heinz was very good friends with Pistola, and, uh, oh, I mean, like, we were all good friends with Bradley as well, but I think that just really came because we didn't want Pistola to join another team. I think we were more worried about what he could do on another team than he could in terms of like in terms of us like hindering the competition um is kind of like a thing that we thought of we were just thinking well if we pick up a soul then that pretty much eliminates any other potential of a top <laughs> team forming and we were like well there's no reason not to and we picked them up and instantly had the same amount of success and i think it was just i, th I think that was pretty much the main decision maker on that and we just we felt terrible for bradley but i think he understood i think bradley's always had a very good um attitude in terms of team changes and like like being understanding especially because a lot of people would be like very angry with us as like individuals and even like friends and stuff but he was like dude he's like if I'm, if I'm gonna get dropped for anyone I'm glad it's Pistola it's like that man, like it, it was, it's he, he kind of like joked about it I know he was always upset about it um he kind of like 
yeah, he he would joke about it with us. He'd be like, he's like, you guys suck for dropping me, but he, and then but he he'd still like be understanding. So that was always really cool, and I respect Bradley for that a lot. Yeah, that's that's really cool because of course, I mean, it's you're, you're not no one's ever gonna be hot like, yay, I got dropped. Yeah, right? yeah, especially so, after winning. So. Yeah, so that that's really cool of him. I I wasn't aware that he was because uh, I think in in Halo Three, he, his reputation definitely in the community wasn't the best. So I mean, like the most bipolar person I've ever met. Like <laughs> he's, he goes from like the sweetest, nicest kid ever outside of land, outside of tournaments and stuff. But when you're playing him, he's literally like cutting your throat he's talking so much smack and then after games like good game guys good game it's just like he's the he's the biggest like difference when it comes to inside and outside of game it's it's quite comical do, do you think there's <laughs> something like because I, I heard you also mention that you kind of got pissed at ryan noob in halo 4 for talking smack in game um but my interview with him he seems like a very kind of like nice guy do you think that if you talk you know um like you know, talking trash in game. If you keep it within certain parameters, is that like all's fair and love and war kind of scenario, or should you not talk? Like, what, what's your what's your I, opinion? I don't on care this? at all about in game trash talk. I I'm literally like, I want you to trash talk me so I can come at you like ten times harder because I've always been like, if anyone knows anything about me and trash talk, if you trash talk me, I literally turn into a different player. Like, I turn into like I'm coming for your soul like i will destroy you every time and i will let you know like i don't ever start the trash talk but if someone says something to me it's like i've had teams like they'll, they'll trash talk me and then i'll just destroy them and then like after that like they will specifically say do not say a word to snipe down like that's like how people like have, have kind of become and it's hilarious at this point but i don't care at all about in-game trash talk i think if anything it, it, unless you're like kind of a head casey it should only make you want to play better and do better but what I really get annoyed of is outside a game when players are like, like individually picking apart other players and they're like in their in their gameplays. Like you'd be like, yeah, I think this person's weak in communication. That's that's one thing. But when you're like, this person sucks as a teammate. He doesn't do this right. Doesn't do this right. That's like that's when I get offended and I'm like, who? Like what are you like? Why why don't you stop worrying about other players and start fixing stuff like from yourself? Like maybe work on something better yourself. And that's when like that's like where me and Ryan have got into it. Um, it's cause like, I, I, he doesn't talk really trash to me in game, but when I hear him, you know, like saying stuff about me as a player or me, when I've only had success the past two years and I still hear him like, kind of like very unrespectfully saying things to, to my teammates about me as like a player and a teammate, it's like, what have you kind of like, what are your comparisons like to mine over like that time? I just feel like when I feel very disrespected is when I start to get extremely upset and that's really the only time that you know like i'll really f have an issue with an individual um because trash talk is fine but it's really when it starts to get like when it when someone deserves respect and they don't get it is when i'm like that's when i'll get offended yeah it's totally fair and i I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you except i was one of those head casey players where if you wanted to get me to suck you just said trooper you really? suck and then uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's players like that all over the place so yeah. it's like you know like there's some people you can literally like play with because of that alone. I remember like Clutch, Clutch is the biggest biggest shit talker ever. Like he he would talk so much smack, but if you said something to him, I swear like he would just like he'd shut down, just instantly shut down. I'm like, I'm like, is it the players that talk the most trash that are the biggest head case players? Because like they, like they need that kind of like I need to trash talk you to feel better about my gameplay. But as soon as someone like calls you out, they're like, oh crap, you called me out. I hope my team didn't hear him. They think I suck. Like that kind of. Like it, and I think that's I think that kind of like I put those two together after a while and I was like I think it is the players that talk the most trash that really have the hardest time dealing with trash talk. Oh, that was definitely me too. I talk so much trash in Toronto yeah. and just suck. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> anybody talk trash to me it was game over. Yeah. So yeah, recently I mean you've done really really well. You've won nine of your last thirteen events. This is like wow. Halo Four and H Two A obviously. Um, so we've talked a little bit about Halo Four. Let's get into the Halo Two anniversary part of it. Um, so you first, the PAX Prime Showdown, I don't think, none of you, nobody had played the game at this point, right? Like, this was like, um, this was just like a come play and see how good you are at this new Halo. Um, so your team was really good. You won. It was you, Pistola, Ace, and Strong side. Um, <clears throat> you guys did really well. And then the next event, the only difference was Strong side to Flame Sword, but you got sixth. So was this like a matter of people playing the game, practicing? Was this a matter of you guys not uh, is Flame Sword that much worse than Strong Side in Halo Two? Is that is that what it is? like? What what happened here? Because it's 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 kind of strange to see a team go from first to sixth with only one yeah. one swap. No one had actually um no one had still actually played the game at the oh, next okay. tournament. Uh, the the game still hadn't yeah, been released. And I think um I think one of the biggest factors of that was just that 
we didn't play outside the game. I was the only one playing Halo 3 all the time. Like, I played Halo 3 nonstop, and no one else played any Halo. Um, and I think that just that knowing the Halo mentality, you need to play, and you just need to, like, keep your brain up to par with, you know, Halo mechanics. But I think at that tournament, I remember playing our first series against, like, Ninja's team. We lost to Ninja's team, and that was so unfortunate because when we warmed up, we warmed up against, like, it was, like, Snake Bite, that Snake Bite World 2 CLG roster. Um, and when we warmed up against them, they did not play us in one 4v4 game type. They ran four free-for-alls on all three maps, and we were just, like, start up a fours, and they, they had host lobby powers, and they just refused to start up a fours match, and then we went straight into our series against Ninja's team without playing Warlord once, and they had, they had played um, straight ripping five times on Warlord Flag in the warm-up booth before that, and we didn't play one game as a team together. We didn't know how spawns worked. We didn't know how anything worked. We had to go straight into a series, and so we just got wrecked on both Warlords. We got wrecked on Warlord King and Warlord Flag, and we won the whatever the other game type was because we knew how to play it. Um, <laughs> but it was just that was the most frustrating thing I think at that tournament was just feeling so under practice compared to the rest of the teams who had been playing nonstop, and we were the first series to play. That CLG also was the last series to play. So I don't know if it was like a sabotage or what it was, but it still just doesn't make any sense to me that they chose to not play any 4v4 game types going into this tournament. And like they were like, well, we've never played these maps before. It's like, well, play the maps that you're going to be playing in the tournament. Why am I playing 8-man, 15-minute free-for-alls on these maps? Like, you're not learning anything. It was awful. It was awful. We didn't know anything that was going on. So I think that was a huge factor. So I don't really think Flamesword had any, like, I don't think him and him and... Strong side are really like that much of a difference between like our team. I think it was just the fact that we were so. It's like, it's like us going into the tournament. That was this like that was like our same skill going into the very first tournament where no one had played to everyone playing the game and us still not have played the game since that tournament. It was it was not fun. It was we got kind of wrecked. So you were playing a lot of like um, you were just playing the MLG playlist in Halo Three between the. I was just always playing. How 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 big was the population at that point? Like, were you finding games quickly at level? Like, I'm assuming you still have the general grade, whatever. I was streaming all the time. People were playing against me. I was getting a lot. I was getting a lot of games. Actually, I didn't really have an issue finding any games. I think the biggest issue is just people quitting. But I don't even think actually the modding was the the biggest issue. But overall, I really didn't have too many problems. I think it was it was actually a lot of fun. I, I loved playing the Halo Three playlist. The cheaters made their way into Halo Three eventually, eh? Because they. Yeah, they because the difference, I mean, I wasn't a, an incredibly high level in Halo 2, but I, even at my level, cheating was so rampant. I think I was like mid-30s in a few different playlists, so I was okay, but not good. And then uh, there was cheating constantly, but at level 50 in MLG and in Halo 3, there was no cheating. Like, you, maybe you'd get bridged like one or two games a night if you were running with four people, but that was, <clears throat> it was much better. Um, so I'm kind of sad to hear that that game got... Yeah, it just started getting infested with cheaters. Uh, during the glory days of Halo 3 when it was populated, um, it, there was no cheating. I never got cheated. Um, yeah. But wait, as soon as, you know, when the game died down and not very many people were playing anymore, uh, that's when the cheaters really started to come out. I don't, really, I don't even understand. It didn't make any sense to me. I was like, why are you guys cheating in a game that's, like, not even populated anymore? Yeah. That makes sense to me. <laughs> That sounds very counterintuitive. Maybe it's just because yeah. they, they wouldn't get banned or something. Yeah, I don't know what it was. <laughs> Um, okay, so let's talk about EG a little bit because you guys are obviously doing incredibly well. Um, you came sec you came second with Pistola, and then he broke his hand, and then you guys picked up Lethal. Obviously, that first event things weren't clicking perfectly yet. You get third, but still, still a very good placing. I mean, you only you only lost to like I think it was CLG, right? That beat you guys. CLG and the denial, yeah. Yeah, so it was only the two teams that ended up winning the tournament. So you guys still played very well, and then after that, something happened, and you guys just stopped losing and you became this like ridiculous ridiculous team so first do you think if you if you think pistola had never broken his hand would you would you guys be the exact same situation or is there something about lethal and his play style that just fits perfectly that kind of like meshes this team together i, I think there's no question that if we had pistola that we could still easily be in the same situation we are i can't can't guarantee anything um but yeah i do i do think with him on the team i think that we could for sure still have extreme dominance in this game but i think tj uh, lethal brings a very good element to our to our team he's the least selfish player uh, he's always you know pushing up making plays and if, if you're calling something out like he, he's jumping off ring three to try and help you on sanctuary because he's just like he wants to help all the time and uh i think he's very respectful of us three as competitors and he knows how much success that we've had so he's like he's very happy 
to be on this team with players that you know he can like really respect and um and he's also very very uh, nice outside the game with us and so i think he's building those friendships with us and i think at the first event uh with, that we played with lethal a, a big issue was you know we practiced a lot and we were, we were doing very well online but uh one of the one of the mid or warlocks got changed two days before the tournament the map got changed and we had practiced on a certain we had, in warlocks five of the 10 game types at the time or whatever yeah, it was yeah it's half and we played on the the new warlock that they had tested and said, "Hey, this is going to be the tournament." We were very good at that. Then they switched it back to the old warlock, where spawns went from flags to portals, and it was portals every time. And so um, now, with the way warlocks played, is you poured out every you poured out all the time. And you're always playing portals, but before it was like get on plats and get top center because they're going to be spawning flags. And so when they switched it back to portal spawns, we actually didn't get to practice that before going to the tournament because we had to take the Wednesday off, and then we were flying out on Thursday. And so we got to the tournament, and we didn't know how to play war or warlord anymore, and it hurt us. But I I don't think that's like the sole reason we didn't do well. But after that, like we just were able to practice nonstop and really able to be very constructive on our um on our strategies and what needed to get done. And I think I think that's a huge difference between us and other teams is that when we say that something get, needs to get done and we know that that's the right play that needs to be made is like, we change that instantly. We don't, it doesn't take us two more, three more mistakes for us to realize that that needed to get done. It's this easy to get done now, next game we played, if we played that game back, we'd probably win that game because we'd be doing what needed to get done. So like, I think that's really what kind of separates us from other teams is we don't, we, we've been playing for so long that like, we don't get into habits anymore. Like we just, we just do what's right and do what needs to get done instead of just playing the same way over and over and over. Yeah, the three. I mean, the three of you guys, especially Lethal, I know a little bit less about, but the three of you guys have such incredible Halo minds. You've been at the top for so long that it's it's not really surprising. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about packs. Um, the only real series you guys had was the winter bracket finals. Uh, it seemed like everything else was kind of. It was almost hard to believe that you guys were pay- playing for fifty grand because it didn't it didn't really look like it. Like it was the the finals, especially. I think you guys swept them, right? The, yeah. the winter bracket finals was the only like really close series. Um, so did you did you feel like that was going to be the case? Like nobody here is even going to be able to really challenge us? Or the confident me says yes because of how dominant we had been in the previous tournament. The G for G tournament, we dropped one game going into this tournament. I feel like teams still didn't practice as much as they should have. I believe that when we played CLG in the first series, I wasn't really feeling too well. I felt really like lightheaded because I hadn't been able to eat all day because we, we had to get there super early in player series. And that was actually, I'll definitely say that was my worst series out of any series I've played all of season one versus CLG. And when we won that series 3-2, um, it was just a, an amazing feeling to know that even when I'm not playing like up to like my standards or my, my level, that my team is still able to pull out a victory against who we consider the second best team there and that felt great knowing that i have like that confidence in my teammates to like pick up if any one player is not performing well like we have three more that'll pick up right after him like that's what is so cool about our team is i've never had i've never had a team that there is no weak link at all there's no there's no one on our team that you can be like he's the worst on that team like it's so easily argumented and um I think after that is like my confidence went through the roof and that's why like I came out firing and the rest of our team came out so strong in the second series versus CLG. It's because we were like, if we could do that playing not our not to our best potential, like let's come out firing and let's see if, like what they let's see what kind of fight they can put up if we're playing our best. And I think we really showed that. And I think that's what we wanted to end the season on is we wanted to be very we wanted to put our foot down and be like, We're the best here, like you guys need to reconsider. You guys need to make changes if you want to get up to our level. I think that's really the the message that we wanted to send to people, and it was um it was really cool. It was just all built up because of how much how much we wanted to win and how much we wanted to prove to people. I know Roy wanted it more than anything because he he thought he would him and him and Launchbox both thought they were done forever. They never thought they'd compete again, and I'm the guy who's like, well, I don't want to let them down, and I want to make sure that you know that they made the right decision to come back and I, I want to win with with them and share success with these players and i know tj didn't want to be the guy who's like well you're not as good as pistola and he's always yeah, like yeah. people are always and he's always joking about it and he's like well hopefully i'm just as good as or like always just making jokes about it and yes. i think just i think we just wanted it a lot more and we definitely were not playing scared or playing for like playing like we had more to lose or anything i think we were just playing like we are playing to win like there's nothing else affecting our minds or anything so i think that's just like one of the biggest reasons is how strong of um mindsets that we all have 
Were you guys scared about the momentum CLG might have after that probably the most ridiculous series I've ever seen in a Halo tournament against Noble Black? We were not worried about that because we had played Noble Black earlier in the tournament and we beat them. Um, it, it wasn't like decently. It was 3-1 when he played them earlier, but I didn't feel like they were like that top tier of a team. And the fact that their series was so close with literally like seconds, seconds, flag caps, like just the most ridiculously close. I've never seen a series so close in my entire life. Yeah. And the fact that that was so close, I think that almost gave us more confidence going into the series. We were like, well, if they played them so close, then they can't feel very good going up against us, considering that we had already beaten Noah Black, we had just beaten them, and then they struggled hard against Noah Black, and we felt like we were better than. And um, I think going into that last series, as soon as we played them in that game one, and we kind of smoked them, like, I mean, it was a 1-0 on sync flag, but they did not touch our flag. I, I think they may have had two seconds combined of flag pull time. And we just controlled the whole game. And I think after that, like, they were, they kind of, like, felt like they had their backs against the walls and we just weren't letting up on the pressure. Yeah. So you guys said, I mean, you said you wanted to, like, make the other teams feel like, hey, we need to do something. And you definitely did because every single team made changes. It's some pretty drastic ones. So do you feel like any of these new teams pose, like, a serious threat? Are you, like, keeping your eye on any of them? Or, like, who, what are your sort of predictions for what are the, the best teams going to be? Um, I'd say, honestly, to be completely honest, I'll be brutally honest on this one. I don't feel like any team got that much better, if at all. Um, I really, I mean, there's a ton of time left before this next tournament, so there's a lot of practice time, which is exactly what they needed, because if, if there was a tournament within three weeks after the season one finals, it'll, I don't think it would have been very good. Um, but overall, I think, you know, I think the potential of that Ryan New Brando roster with Contra and, um, who's their fourth? They did. Nated has has good potential, but I I still just I still feel like when they get like when they get to tournament situations, I feel like the plays that they make online may not be as easily like those aren't the first plays that are going to come to their head because it's it's so much easier to make a you know a calm play call I, when I'm sitting here in my house with no distractions, nothing going on, just my teammates' voices. It's really easy to make the right call, right play calls all the time, but on land, like you're being like bombarded with other sounds, other things going on around you, that it's not e as easy to come up with the best answer and best solution to a play right away. And I think that might affect them. I still think, they're, I still think they could easily be a top three team at this point in time. Um, I think Cloud9 has a long way to go. And I think what um, I think what their biggest issue, once again, is even when they had Ninja on the team, is their mentality. I think they're... I think they're um, I think their like communication, what they need to work on is awful. I think that they don't approach things the correct way. Um, it just seems like a bunch of arguments and it's like, well, we need to do this. And then it's like, well, I don't know. I, I feel like they're not, they don't, they're not constructive enough, but I feel like they have very high potential compared to where they're at at the moment. And I, I, I would love to see that team at the top because, you know, I love Pistola, um, great friend, and I always want to see him succeed and do well. And I'd love to compete against him in the finals um, of all these tournaments. And one, you can't ever doubt uh, Ogre 2. So I think those four teams at the moment are the top teams, CLG, C9 and uh, that Randall roster, but I don't think at the moment that may be the case. I, I think that we're still kind of like pretty far ahead of these other teams, but I think with how much time's left going into this next tournament, if they can practice appropriately and put forth the right effort and uh, constructive criticism, that they could definitely catch up to us. Um, but, you know, like we're, we're not a roster that's going to let that happen easily. And uh, I'm, just, I'm, excited. I'm excited for this first tournament just to see where all these teams have come and uh, if these changes really did help them out. Yeah, it sounds like you're you're pretty confident. And uh, when I when I've spoken to some of the other pro players or just some friends that I have in the community, uh, the general consensus about because I this is one of my favorite questions to ask people is how do you beat EG? Because you guys look have looked so good recently. And uh, a number of of top players and uh, Ryan Noob even said this on in in his interview uh, is that you guys have to beat yourselves. He thinks um, like you your team is so good that the only way other teams are going to beat you is if you guys don't practice or shoot yourself in the foot or choke I or something. <laughs> um, so it's, it's kind of, do, what can you do to prevent that? Are you just going to keep really focused? Or? I, think, I think like, I think we're all here. We're all here for one reason is to win. And we know what it takes to win because of how like, how long we've been playing. Like we, we know that you're not going to win if you don't play. And especially with, I think, I think that's a pretty, I'm actually kind of respecting, respectful of them for saying that because that's uh, actually a huge compliment to us as a team that they feel like the way that they'll beat us is if we beat ourselves, which is, you know, that's how a lot of top teams fold. Yeah. And I, I don't think that 
I know. I hang out with my teammates. You know, I, I was just there this past weekend. I, saw, um, I, I hang out with my teammates all the time outside of the game, and it's just like we want it so bad all the time. We want to win every single tournament, and I don't think we're slowing down. So I, I hope I hope they can find another way uh, to to surpass us because I don't think we're going to be beating ourselves very soon. And uh, we know we know what's on the line, and we know what what we want. So um, I hope I hope that. Uh, <laughs> that we get some really good series at these next few tournaments because I'm, I'm excited to see all the competition. Yeah, you guys you guys seem like very good friends. You wouldn't even take the $50 to draw uh, a penis on Lunchbox. I would bet that decision. Yeah. I, if I could make that again, I would definitely take the $50 to draw a penis on Lunchbox's face. That would have been great. <laughs> he, he, seems like, he seems like a pretty laid-back guy. I, I think he, he is, like, but he, he told me afterwards, he's like, I would have drawn a dick on your face. I was like, well, man. <laughs> Okay, next time you're getting it all over the place. I was like, you have double dicks all the way down to your freaking face, <laughs> all the way down to your mouth, man. I mean, it's all over the place. But <laughs> yeah, next time a, I know. Got to make a deal to split that money next time. Yeah, no, right? Go. Yeah. <laughs> so, are there any Forge maps that you've seen um, or that you've played on yourself that you are like, oh, I really want this map to be in season two? Because that's obviously one of the big buzzes right now. Is like, what are the new maps going to be? Because we need a new map. Three is getting boring. Yeah. Um, I think that. See, the thing is, like, I like all the game types that we have right now, but I do agree that the same three maps over and over and over is not good for um, the scene and it kind of growing a little bit. But I think that um, I think that the map Tesla is pretty strong. I think that it could be some good flag game types on that, maybe a bomb game type if we were to take out one of the bombs. I don't, I don't really think the bomb game types are weak, though. See, I, I want a I map that has a good King of the Hill game type because I think Warlord King of the Hill is weak. And I, I, I don't even think either of the King of the Hill games that we have right now are, like, are, that, are that strong. Um, maybe even take maybe even take one of the the, uh, the oddball on warlord out and replace that with something. Um, maybe even put a third bomb in instead of having that warlord ball game type. But uh, I think Tesla is a pretty good map. I haven't really played on too many other maps, but I still think there may be some better better options out there. But overall, I think it's good because I like the Tesla. I like how Tesla looks um, like aesthetically. I think I think the um, I think there's some cool scenery in those maps that we need some we need some different types of of looks to maps. We need some, we need some like even just like trees or stuff. There's something yeah. that'll just make the maps look pretty. But I know there are a lot of frame rate issues on Forge maps, which is a big problem. And I know it's always been a problem. Halo Three had ter terrible lag issues on Foundry maps, Onslaught, and um, Amplified all the time. And I know that's just a big issue, but I don't think that'll be too much of an issue because I feel like the 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 coding in this game is very good in terms of online play. So I, I'm hoping that you know we can get some more maps into the rotation because I think I think the three maps right now is definitely um, hurting the viewer experience for when people are watching online. Yeah, I, I agree, and the, the game types you brought up are definitely some of the ones that would be my first choices to be replaced as well. Um, okay, so let's go into just a little bit more of like Halo general stuff because that was kind of the overview of your career. That's like the longest longest section of this interview, the beat of it, I guess you could say. Um, so how do you how do you play the game? Do you play it because you said you got really good really quickly? Do you spend a lot of time like thinking about how to play it, or are you just one of those people who just picks up the controller, plays, and the right moves come seem to come to you? Because I think you're so good at sniping and your BR is very good. And you, you've always been touted as like this incredibly skilled like with your shot, and I think that's almost overshadowed the fact that you also take some incredibly weird routes that always work out for you. Like I think you were the first person that I saw at least to be flanking, taking long haul on pit off the start instead of going through rockets or rushing OS. So do you, how much time do you spend thinking about the game or is it more just like playing it and grinding it and seeing what works? Honestly, like this is something that's just so, this is hard to explain. Uh, Cause I have so many different scenarios that go through my head when I make a play that it's like, like, it's not just like, like when I jump from, let's say courtyard rock to carbine on sanctuary, like I'm not just thinking I need to get to the carbine and put shots on people. I'm thinking, all right, if I jump here, what's going to be the, where are my teammates at? Where are going to be the best angles? Where are they going to be spawning? What wall am I closest to? So if I get shot at, I can dip my head and get out of there fast enough to where I can live. And it's like, there's so many things that go through my head with every decision. So like when I make, when I make flank routes, it's, I'm picturing based on my teammates' callouts, where all four people are on the map and what they're looking at. So I know where their areas are at and what I can kind of sneak around. And it's it's weird that, I don't know, I don't even know how I do it. It's just so subconscious at this point that it just, like, the play is just kind of like, I know what to do so quickly that it really helps out because I honestly think that, I don't think, I think my best asset as a, as a player, I mean, yeah, I, I'm a great sniper, um, I have a good shot, 
I think my best asset is my positioning on the map because I, I put myself in the positions to allow myself to hit those snipe shots, to be in the positions where they're looking at me and I can pick up two or three quick snipe kills because by the time that by the time the first person is calling it out to the second guy, that guy's already got my aimer on his head and he needs to either be ducking around something or he needs to already be looking and shooting at me because I feel like my reaction time is faster than the, like a lot of other players that it allows me to, to relocate very quickly and that's that's why I feel like my sniper is so dominant is because you know I can line the shots up real quick and um, I, I listen to call outs so I know exactly where someone's out and my in game awareness is so high that I can keep tabs and like I have like a ticker that's going down on my head. Like if I snipe someone ten seconds ago and I'm sniping someone else and I snipe this other guy seven seconds later, I'm thinking three, two, one and then as soon as that hits one I'm already looking for the guy that just spawned and knowing where he's gonna spawn based off of where players are. And it's just, that's just like, that's just something that comes with just so many hours and just so many, like, just games against top players and just, it really, it, it's just, that's not something that can naturally really come to you without being able to, like, put in the time and having, like, the knowledge of the game in general. Because just knowing how the game works is huge in terms of um, being able to make the plays you play, the, ma the plays you make. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because you don't really get much credit for your positioning, but I remember you 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 were one of the players I used to watch in MLG uh, when they had the VOD section after the events, and you could go back and watch like whole games from one person's point of view. It was that funny now that you're teaming with them, but it was actually you and Lunchbox were the two players because I'd watch you and then you'd start sniping. I'd be like, okay, never mind, I can't do that. But I, I'll learn the positioning. <laughs> I'll learn the positioning part and then focus. Um, so it, it's kind of interesting to hear how you how you do it mostly subconsciously. Um, do you spend a lot of time like thinking about it outside the game? Like when you're just like sitting at home, like maybe on the bus home or what, driving? I think about Halo a lot for sure. Um, I don't really think about like what I can do for positioning wise, but I just, I kind of like, I just like go through different scenarios in my head all the time and think about like, well, what would happen if I'd done this? Or like, well, I made this play right. right. I need to make sure I keep doing that like over and over again. But Overall, it's just it, Halo is so situational that it's really just dependent on what you know is going on in the game. So, uh, and it's funny you mentioned Lunchbox because I think, like looking back at the last tournament and watching like some of the not like VOD but watching their broadcast, uh, the dude has the most amazing positioning. Like he's he's such a good team player. Um, if there is one person as like a teammate that is like the best player for their team it's lunchbox because he is always putting shots on people who he'll only put the number amount of shots on that person that he can until he looks into uh, like before he knows that he won't be able to get any more shots than that person he'll already be shooting someone else on the map like he's always putting shots on people and he never spends too much time trying to find someone b without making a play that's like putting the team in a good position to like get a cap or like he's always pushing forward it, it, it's just it's great having someone like that on the team because it only benefits my play style pro like appropriately and especially with him and Roy I feel like me and Roy's play styles are similar in a way where we're both I'm I'm just I'm an APG on the map like if I don't have a sniper in my hands I'm in your face I'm super aggressive all the time um but I think it, it's just I think all of our play styles I think we have the best four mixture of play styles that you could ask for, like in terms of players in this game. So that's what I think is another reason for our extreme success so far. Yeah, it's really actually cool seeing Roy and Lunchbox play styles and almost how like over time they've developed to be these like perfect, this like perfect pairing that just it, it's yeah. it's almost it's, uh, it's awesome and it's really cool because I know because of the reason that they're brothers is the fact that like their callouts are so like they hear their brothers call out and that's clicking with them like instantaneously they, that's like it's, it's just like a conditioned response to respond to your brother's voice that their teamwork is just so on point and on par together that they're all, like if if he's calling something out then box is already like thinking of what the easiest way is to help that person it's really cool to see that kind of like from a third person's perspective so um it's it, their teamwork is incredible and it's awesome to have that on the, on the team it only only benefits me <laughs> yeah it must make your job a lot easier it does um so how how did you get so good at sniping or is it just like literally you play the game you just have really good hand-eye coordination i know some people like to run like drills where they like try and you know throw grenades up snipe those like was there anything in specific that you really did to work on your sniping or are you just uh, gifted in that it's, sense dude, it's my positioning i swear i swear like i, I put myself in the bed uh, not very often are people shooting back at me when I'm when I'm picking people off and it's because like I put myself in the spot that I know that they're not going to be looking because my other teammates are the more important person at the time and so I pick people off when they're spawning I pick people off when they're running to the side like I very rarely 
am I really fighting people that are like looking directly at me? And um, I feel like that is my biggest like biggest asset. I mean, I hit, I hit, I feel like I feel like I have a different way of sniping, a very different way of sniping than every other player. And I think people try and like no scope or hit fancy shots all the time. I take one quick scope and I back off. Like, and that's I feel like I feel like quick scoping is definitely the the way to go in this game. There's a bigger hitbox. And no scoping is not easy at all in this game. Um, but I don't think I think sniping is pretty pretty simplistic in this game overall. But uh, I think I, I honestly just think I just have a different form of sniping than a lot of other players, and uh, that's fine with me. I mean, I don't know if people just don't watch my don't watch my gameplay and don't watch me snipe. But I feel like a lot of people could you know maybe take a lot of different angles because I think that's another thing with me is I know more angles on every map than players than other players do that that use the sniper but that also just comes with the fact that i've been uh, the sniper for every team i've ever been on since 2005 so it's kind of like that's just like conditioned on what what to do and what you need to do with a sniper rifle yeah but even so i think you're being a little bit modest because i've been like over the past two days since we've been talking about doing this i've, I've gone back and watched a ton of your footage and some of the shots you hit are it, I've, I've watched them five times i'm like that still doesn't make sense how do you do that yeah. <laughs> and it's purely like you'll you'll just hit these crazy like cross screen like the guy will be shooting you from the top left and you just put like it, so there was nothing that's just pure talent and hours into the game you didn't do anything yeah, specific I yeah I, I didn't i don't think i never really did anything specific i just kind of know like where your bullets go when you quick scope where they're gonna be and i i just feel like i'm really good at um the thing that really helps me out with sniping is you you snipe you put the ammo where the person's gonna be not where they are and so that was like one of the biggest things i realized when like in halo 3 is you lead you lead if you're quick scoping you lead where their head's gonna be and then you just like you line it up so like someone like i don't know if this is gonna work but like someone someone's jumping here i have my aimer here because his head's gonna peak there and so as soon as his head peaks there is when he starts to fall so i know exactly where his head's gonna be as soon as he starts his jump so i just put it right there and wait for him to go there so like that's like that's that's my form of sniping that it feels a little different. I feel like people people a lot of times will follow the player until they line the shot up, or I'm lining it up before the player's there. So it's like I feel like I'm that's where I'm a lot quicker, and that's why I can hit those shots and be more consistent than other players. It's, it's interesting to hear your philosophy on that because you probably well not probably and at least from the, the all the Halo I've seen, I think you're undoubtedly the best sniper in Halo ever. I mean Roy recently might he might be up there with you, but I, I don't think there's it's anybody. Basic. He's he's a really good sniper, but I still don't think he hasn't been as insanely good as you for as insanely long of a period. You've been incredible with that weapon the entire time on the on the circuit. Um, so what? Let's uh, hold on one second here. Um, so as a sniper, the the bleed through thing in H in MCC must kind of drive you nuts. Does it? Does that Actually, it? not at all. I think it's hilarious because I hit headshots <laughs> more than any other player, which is why it's like so beneficial for us because I don't and like if someone's weak, it's it's funny because like a lot of players will be like, Oh, he was one shot and I body shot him and I didn't get the kill and I'm just like, Well hey man, you gotta hit the headshot. That's just how it works in this game and I don't I don't really mind it too much. But um overall I wish bleed through was a thing, especially for like for melees, but I mean I I'm I'm you know, conditioned enough to where it's it's not a big deal anymore. You know how many shots in a melee is going to take to kill. You know if you're down in a BR fight, if you're down two shots, you're pushing in for the melee because if he melees you, you're on the same level field and it's a one shot for either of you to kill. Um, I think it, it's just it's just a different type of... Uh, you just have to add that to your play style and just adapt to it, really. And I, I don't really think it's that big of a difference. I don't think it would make the game any better, any worse. I think it's just something that, you know, players are used to from it being in Reach and in Halo 3 that, you know, it's something that they wanted. But overall, I don't really have any problems with it not being in the game. Um, I would prefer it. It was, but I, I don't really, I have no, I have no like, I, I'm not going to say that the game is bad because of that reason or any, or I'm not going to put it down at all because of that. I think it's just all being able to adapt to it. Yeah, that's fair enough. So considering that you've been one of the, uh, the your, throughout your entire career, you've been one of these players that's um, always prolific. Like even when you weren't doing well, um, you were always talked about as a very good player. It wasn't like, oh, snipe downs. I've, I've never really heard anybody say snipe downs washed up. He sucks now, like that. Which you do hear with a lot of other players who've been successful and then kind of fallen down. But that's never really been the case with you. So was there um, was there ever any teammate that I'm, I'm assuming because of this you've been able to team with like almost anybody you wanted in a sense? Has there ever been somebody that you really wanted to team with but you've never had the opportunity to? Over two, hundred percent. This. Um... I, I guess I did have an opportunity to team with them back in Halo 3, but I just didn't take it because I had better options. But 
uh, yeah, he's just a player that, you know, you all, when you're on his team, like, you want to succeed. You don't want to let the goat down. And uh, he, he just brings out the best in all of his teammates. I think his... Um, the way he the way he calls things out, the way the way he um his presence in game, it just makes you feel like you want to always be the best. And I, even just from like watching games and playing, just you know, fun games with him or playing on his team at like a land for like in like money games or something. Like just the way he calls out makes you like excited to play and makes you pumped up. So I definitely um I respect him a lot for sure as a you know competitor. Yeah, for sure. Um, so looking forward a little bit. Um, the HCS season two ends in July or something, June or July, right? And then uh, Halo Five just got announced, comes out in October. So mm. there's going to be a little bit of a gap there. What do you think that there's going to be some tournaments, or what, what do you think is going to happen during that during that period? I'm sure, there'll be some pre-launch tournaments. To be honest, um, for Halo Five, I would not be surprised at all if they have like another like pre-event packs land or whatever whatever it is. Uh, that they kind of did similar to Halo 2 Anniversary. I think the HCS is just a build-up for what Halo 5 is going to be, and I'm perfectly fine with that. You know, it just gives us something to do. It builds up some hype. But I think Halo 5 is going to be huge, and I'm just I'm just really excited, and I'm just glad that we've had something to compete for this whole time until that game is launched. So I'm just very, really thankful for the 343 and um, Twitch, and everyone has really been a big part of the HCS being a thing. So... Uh, that I'm just I'm just looking forward to Halo Five. I think you know it's got potential. I think I think as long as the community can support it and not be cancerous, uh, that it's exactly you know kind of like what we need to put ourselves back in the power seat. And I think um, I think players need to start doing a lot more content and reaching out to fans more and building as building a building a community for themselves, not based around their team. Like I, like Evil Geniuses is you know fantastic. I'm not trying to build a brand around Evil Geniuses. I'm trying to build a brand around like Snipe Down. I want people to you know be fans of me, so no matter what team I'm on, that, you know, like, they support me. It's kind of like a Nate Chat thing, where, you know, like, Nate Chat's got millions of supporters, and he, he brings in 30,000 people to the stream just to watch him play, not not to watch, you know, Call of Duty. They they, they watch to watch him play, so that, that's really cool to see how much of, um, how much that can really build and help a game grow, because if, I don't think if there were players like, you know, like I'm going to use Nate Chat as, again as an example, I don't think if there were players like him, I don't think Call of Duty would be anywhere near it, where it is today, and, uh, that's something you know. It's kind of it's kind of something to you know strive for, and I think it's really cool. And I want to start doing stuff like that. And it's a long process, but you know, I got a long life to live, so we'll see. Well, I, I completely agree with you, and it's actually that I'm really glad you brought this up because it's like a perfect little segue into my into my next question. Is that it seems that all of you EG guys, well, specifically you and Roy, are starting to do your own content thing. And uh, again, when I talk to people in the scene or people who, who do journalism or people who are around Halo. Um, you're kind of everyone says, well, Halo needs a nade shot, and if there's one guy who's going to do it, it's going to be Snipe Down. You know, he's one of the best play. He's the, one of the best players in the game. Has been forever. <clears throat> Excuse me. Really good looking guy. You know, like he has all these things going for him. Um, so is that why? Is that kind of like? Are you taking this upon yourself now to do this? Uh, to because to, obviously you've been doing these like recent like these community cl the community clip off that you have coming up. Uh, yeah. Your daily content. These clips that you're putting out like very very regularly now. Um, is this something that you're really going to, like, I guess you kind of answered this a little bit already, but like, how, how much time do you plan on investing in, into, into really building up your own brand? I mean, I, I plan on, I plan on doing a lot. Um, I think, I, I think it is something that I really, you know, I've been complete, like not complacent, but I've been like happy with, you know, how Halo's gone for me. Um, but I look back on the past and I think of, man, I missed out on just like the biggest opportunities I could have asked for. And I, I, I really put a lot of, um, I, I don't want to say pressure on myself. I, I, I put a lot of, like, I don't know, I, not good vibes on myself because of how much more I could have done in the past to help Halo be in a better place than it is today. Mm -hmm. And I know we didn't really have, like, the capabilities that weren't really streaming back then, but still, like, I, I could have done, like, I was given, like, you know, like, a mini camcorder that I could have done vlogs with and just things like that that I could have just, like, done content for people because I had so many fans back in the day, and I still have a lot of fans, and I appreciate all the support. But I, I really just, I love Halo so much that it, because it's been such a big part of my life, that I want it to have success. And I think that's one of the biggest things that is kind of like, like pushing me to do something like this. And um, it also really helps that, you know, I, I would love to be like a pioneer of the growth of Halo. And it'd be, it'd be fantastic to be, you know, people like saying like, hey man, thank you for you know, being a big reason why Halo's back to where it is. Like that, that comment right there just means so much. And um, I, I just feel like it needs to be done by, I don't care if it's by me or if it's by someone else. Like I just, I want it to be done. And I, 
you know, I want, I, I think my biggest, like, hindrance in the whole situation is editing, because I don't know how to edit anything, like, I just, I put my voice over a video and a clip, and I'll post it online, like, I, I don't know how to, like, do cool editing or cool intros and stuff like that, so I think that's just really going to come with time, but I, I just, I, I really want to, you know, be a big, big part of the reason why Halo's coming back, because I care so much for the game. Well, I think the passion really shows, and like I said, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, you're the name that everybody mentions has the the most potential. I think you and Ninja probably are the two guys who could really, um, you know, ambassador Halo. And so far, you're both starting to. And don't worry about the editing thing because I'm right there with you. I just hit start yeah. recording on. I hit start recording on OBS and yeah, that's what I do. And I pray nothing goes to shit. <laughs> that's yep. Not, um, okay, so we'll go into the like the the final section of the interview here. It's the a few questions, almost like a not quite a speed round, but more more questions like that that are just kind of uh, initial off the top of your head sort of things. So, um, favorite team you were ever on, and why? Honestly, this one is straight ripping are pretty tied right now. Straight ripping is just because I was young and I was really just having fun. Um, it really molded me into a person, like a different personality, and it, it kind of gave me a lot more confidence. I was a shy kid in high school, and it just kind of broke me out of my shell, I'd say. And uh, I think the team I want now is because of how serious we take it and how mature we are. And as a team, we all want the same thing. None of us are egotistical. None of us are wanting to succeed more than another player on our team. And I think it's it's really nice to have friends that I know I, I can be friends with for, like, the rest of my life. Um, I don't talk as much with the old straight open guys, but I can still consider them, like, good friends. But um, these guys that I'm teaming with now, they live really close. I can hang out with them all the time. And they're just very, very similar to my personality style. And it really works out nicely. Like, I think I'm going to be going to, like, Lunchbox's wedding, and uh, I think it's in November. And I'm just, you know, it's just it's just really cool to have, you know, after what I thought I would never have again after being off that Sherry Ripon team and being on the teams that I've been on, to have that again, it's, I feel very fortunate to be in that situation. So I, I definitely, um, this team that I'm on now is quickly, quickly rising the ladder. That's really cool. And uh, definitely, I'm sure a lot of EG fans will be very, very happy to hear that. Yeah. Um, so favorite tournament ever? Favorite tournament definitely got to be Vegas 2008. Uh, I played probably one of, the, one of, if not the best tournaments of my life. I think I went like plus like a positive 110 only against the top eight teams. We played like th four series or something like that. Best tournament of my life, no questions asked. Um, and it, it was just, I won the Old Spice Rising Star, got a trophy for that, and basically all the hard work I'd ever put into it and everything that I had wanted to achieve, I achieved in my first year. And it was just, it was, like I said, in my, I even in my interview after getting Old Spice Rising Star, it was like a dream come true. It was like, am I actually like living this? Like, is this, it was crazy. And uh, that's definitely, definitely the most favorite moment was holding up that $25,000 check or $100,000 check at the end of uh, the Vegas finals. Yeah, it's not, not surprising at all. Yeah. Um, so your favorite map and game type of all time. Now these can be like, uh, you know, if you say pit, you can do like narrow CTF, for example. Like they don't have to be the same thing uh, or all yeah. the same thing. But I'm a, this is I was so mad with it. Pit King of the Hill. I loved that game type. That was like my favorite game type. I loved it. This it was predictable. You could do it, and it, I was just like I would just run around in circles with a sniper rifle, picking people off, and it was just like it was a field day for me. That was my favorite game type. It got removed after a season. I was yeah. so upset when it got <laughs> taken out. I remember I was I literally tried everything I could to get it put back into the rotation. Really? There was like. Yeah, I tried everything, and it's just not happening. But <laughs> that, was, that, would, that would have been my favorite for sure. Favorite map in general? Um, Pit or Sanctuary? Okay, I which, like Sanctuary a lot. Which version? Um, Halo 3 Pit for sure. Uh, I didn't like Halo Reach Pit that much. It was weird. Um, and I... I really like the Halo 2 Anniversary Sanctuary, to be honest. It's easy to move around. I think the ra there's cool jumps that you can do, and there's different strategies that are um, that are nice and neat, and there's definitely a lot of ways to outsmart people with routes, and uh, also, obviously, the massive influence of a sniper rifle on the map. <laughs> I'm sure that contributes just a yeah. little bit. It is a really beautiful map, though. It is very pretty. Uh, Compared to, like, Reach, where it was just, like, all yeah. gray. It was like, oh, what is this? <laughs> yeah, it, looked, it almost looked, like, somber out of Reach. Like, it's yeah. like an asylum or just something. The, the, I think that really hurt Reach. It was just the way every map looked was just so ugly. Yeah, it, it definitely wasn't the prettiest of the Halo games. No. Um, so, your best teammate ever, and your teammate who taught you the most. Oh, Elamite. Um, best com one, of, one of, if not the best communicators I've teamed with. A uh, great friend inside and outside of the game. Really was a big reason for like my success. I mean, I can contribute. Him getting me on Instinct was huge. And um, just that support from someone who I'd never teamed with before and him like really not 
shunning me as like a new player and someone who like he was like almost like threatened by it but more as more of as a welcoming figure that was like i want like i'm glad you're like basically in the scene and i know you're going to do big things was a huge moral support um and i I really you know i considered him you know kind of like as like an older brother when i was on that straight ripping team so it was was really really cool um and i'm still if if there's anyone i'm closest with from that straight ripping team it's elamite for sure yeah, I've I've only had a handful of interactions with him, but he's a very very nice guy. I have nothing bad yeah. nothing bad to say about him at all. So um, yeah, it makes definitely makes sense. Um, okay, so for the next question, I want your one best player of all time, all Halos combined, and then the second half of this question, I'm gonna switch it up a little bit. I want your Snipe Down's top ten H two A players. Oh, shoot, man, I don't even know. <laughs> I, I don't watch enough players. Um... Uh, best player of all time, just from like since I've been around it, I'd have to say Pistola. But I know I, I can't, I can't say, I can't not say Ogre too. Like, there's no question that it, Halo One, Halo Two, he's been a national champion of every single Halo besides Halo Four that he didn't even compete in. So it's like you can't, you can't not say Ogre too. I mean, he's definitely got the accolades. But um, top ten players for Halo Two anniversary, uh, four from my team. So there's me, Lunchbox, Roy, Lethal. This is in no order. Um, I'd say I'd say Royal Two and Snake Bite are up there, but the only thing that can kind of like push them out. Uh, actually, I think I think Snake Bite's attitude has gotten a lot better um, since the season one finals has ended. I, I've actually been watching a few of their scrims, and he's very positive in game. Um, he doesn't he doesn't really complain as much. I think I think Royal Two's attitude is, needs needs a little tweaking. But he's he's just one of the most skilled players like I've ever like watched play. The dude's insane. Um, but I think that I think attitude is actually a, like a factor that people don't really look at enough. I think the same with hysteria. Like like hysteria and Royal Two like are both could just be just the best players if it, like if their attitudes change just a little bit and they could be more constructive. So, but I'd still put them in my top ten. Um, I can't like I want to put Pistol in there, but I haven't seen him play enough that it's like I can't like just out of uh, respect to the other players who have played for so long, I can't put him up there. But he 100% will be in no time a top 10 player. Um, so I think, so I got seven there. Let me see. Uh, man, I can't even. <laughs> what else we got here? Um, I think APG is a really strong player. I think Mick one's really good. Um, yeah, I'll put Mick one up there. I need like a one more. Oh god, it's gotta be someone from the optic roster. Man, I don't even know that. I can't even. I don't watch enough players play. Like I, the people aren't even saying. I'm just like I haven't really watched too much of them play. <laughs> Okay, well, we can leave it at Contra, that. Contra, no, no, not Contra, not Contra. the worst finals. Uh, and I can't say Ryan Dubai either, because he struggled at the past few events. Uh, Maniac, maybe? Maniac? He played extremely well at the past few tournaments, so I guess I can put him up there. Yeah, that sounds fair. Okay, so um, okay. do you follow, or have you like have you looked into, or do you follow any other esports? I know you definitely like you're, you've mentioned Nate Shot, so I, and I think I actually even remember in that interview with Walshy that um, you said that Pulse was flying you guys out to like a COD tournament or something. Oh uh, no, I don't even remember what I really said. I just want to talk about Nate Shot a little bit in that video. Uh, only only other esport I really watch too much is is Call of Duty because I can follow it. Uh, I mean, I've watched a little bit of Counter Strike, not. I have never really sat down and watched like a whole series, just like a little bit of it. I watched some. I watched some League of Legends. I used to play a lot, but I don't really follow. I don't follow like the LCS at all, and I don't really know like who the top teams are. I just will tune in every once in a while and watch a competitive match. But I think Halo and Call of Duty are really the only two that I can like stay somewhat relevant in terms of information in. So I think those would be definitely the two that I'm most focused on, just because I was kind of took part in Call of Duty, so I know a f- I know the players and the teams pretty well. How do you what do you what do you what do you mean by you took part in it? Did you play tournaments or? 
Yeah, I, I went to Call of Duty tournaments for Ghost. Uh, I played like two, like three tournaments, I think, and then I, was, I just decided that I didn't really like the game of Call of Duty. And like I said multiple times earlier in this interview, is that if you don't like the game you're playing, then you're not going to be good at it, and you're not going to want to play it, and that's exactly where I was at. I I respect, like, you know, like, Formula and Naval for doing their thing, and they put so much time into it, and I just didn't. And I'm not, I, I feel like I could, you know, possibly be in the same situation that they're at if I put the time into it, but I just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't muster up the, you know, strength to do it. Every time I played Call of Duty, I was like, I don't enjoy this. And I, I decided I just wanted to stick with Halo, and I wanted to kind of be a pioneer for Halo. Yeah, fair enough. How, how good did you get in League, out of curiosity? In League, I got to, like... I got to gold and ranked, but this was like this was months ago. I don't think I've played really in like a year. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I got to like gold ranked, and then I I instantly quit as soon as I got to gold. But I was I was actually pretty decent at League of Legends. But that was the first computer game I've really taken part in. Yeah, no, me too. It was my first foray into uh, PC games. Yeah. Um, okay, so for your last for the last question, I have this hypothetical that I like to do, and I, I always kind of switch it up a little bit. Um, so basically, we're going to have some aliens come to Earth, and they're going to see how EG, how good EG is. And they're going to clone you, because they're going to say, this snipe down guy, this is the guy. This is okay. who makes EG good. So they clone you. So EG still exists, and little do you know, um, little does that EG know that there's a second version of you, exactly the same. And these, these aliens say, okay, now for, for your life here, you have to build a team with other players that can beat that team. If I, so if it was me and three other players to beat the team that is currently EG. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> they would have to match him in skill. So I'd say, I'd say me, Will, to Snakebite. I can't put a stereo on that team. That would just be the worst time ever. With... <laughs> Constructive criticism. Um, so I, I put us three in there. We need like a, we need a very selfless, aggressive player. APG. With all, yeah, I'd say I'd say me, Royal Two, Snake Bite, and APG would be a very good team. I think we'd all have ex we we would match that team in terms of individual skill, one hundred percent, and aggression. I think aggression is how you win Halo Two. I think I think. Aggression is the biggest factor in how you win games in this game, so I think that would definitely be the the team I'd put together. So if I get kicked off EG, you guys better watch out. The team's gonna come to life. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well that's uh, I guess that's more or less it. So do you have? I'm guessing you have some shout outs or sponsors or anything like that that you wanna that you wanna. Play uh, with? yeah, I can throw some. I can throw some shout outs real quick. Shout out to my girlfriend uh, Celeste Bittersweet. Uh, also, Evil Geniuses. You know everything about them. The Cyber Power PC Monster. Um, Every, everything that's just all the fans that have just been there to support us since day one, whether you're an EG supporter or a Snipe Down supporter, whatever it is, maybe you just like snipers. But, uh, you know, I appreciate it all, and I really hope that uh, you enjoyed this this long interview, and I hope uh, you took the time to listen to it, and I think there's some very good information. And uh, thank you very much for uh, taking the time with me, and thank you for doing this interview, by the way, as well, Dave. Thanks, man. Anyway, uh, I guess that's it. I'll have the audio-only version will be in the description below in case you can't listen to the video. Um, his YouTube, Twitter, and Twitch, Twitch are also will be in the description below. So that does it for us. Thanks, guys. Thank you.